So when things are controlled, you feel safe. When things aren't, it triggers that little guy inside who's like, who's taking care of me? I'm unsafe. It's chaos right now. So it makes perfect sense. I'm Luke Story. For the past 22 years, I've been relentlessly committed to my deepest passion, designing the ultimate lifestyle based on the most powerful principles of spirituality, health, psychology, and personal development. The Lifestylist Podcast is a show dedicated to sharing my discoveries and the experts behind them with you. As a person who used to enjoy my share of cocktails, uh, there are times where I miss some of the rituals involved with drinking because I don't do it anymore. Now, if you're someone who chooses to drink alcohol, good for you. Hopefully you're doing it safely and enjoying the benefits without some of the known side effects. That brings me to our sponsor, Kin Euphorics. These guys make some fantastic non-alcoholic alternative beverages. So if you're looking for a way to fortify your body and your mind and be healthy and vital and enjoy that social drink without the alcohol, you have come to the right place with Kin Euphorics. It's the first non-alcoholic drink for grown-ups who care about things like brain function, hormone harmony, great sex, and of course, de-stressing after an insanely stressful day. And those are easy to come by in today's world, are they not? Kin Euphorics are stacked with the good stuff and none of the bad. So think adaptogenic herbs and mushrooms that help curb stress in the moment and over time, as well as nootropics that support cognitive function like clarity, memory, and creativity. So these guys make three products that I'm really excited about. The first one being High Road. It's got a very herbaceous flavor and a feeling of a lifted mind and relaxed body at the same time. So it's great for a social hour chill with friends. It's great after a long day. You might come home and put a splash of club soda or tonic and a squeeze of lime in there at the little ice, and you've got yourself an amazing non-alcoholic beverage. Next one is Kin Spritz. It's a sparkling brain boost drink without the crash or hangover. I recommend cracking open a spritz around 4 p.m. to beat the afternoon slump and shift from work mode into play mode. Last but certainly not least is the Dream Light. This is a booze-free nightcap. Tastes like Amaro and melts away stress. Plus, you'll likely sleep like a baby and wake up feeling awesome. So we have three delicious alcohol-free cocktails here with three different effects on the mind and body. Really incredible stuff. So if you want to check out Kin Euphorics for yourself and get down with some of these tasty beverages, here's what you do. Go to kineuphorics.com slash Luke. Spelling is K-I-N-E-U-P-H-O-R-I-C-S. That's kineuphorics.com slash Luke. If you use that link, you will save 15% off. All right, no joke, I'm about to hook you up if you're someone who's had issues with gut health, which I would guess is the majority of the human population due to all of the weird stuff that's in our food and water supply, not to mention the uh, widespread use of antibiotics. This product called Just Thrive Probiotic is absolutely incredible. You know, 70 to 80% of your immune system lives in your gut. 80 to 90% of Americans suffer from some form of gut issue, whether it's gas, bloating, diarrhea, indigestion, heartburn, acid reflux, all that nastiness. All of these things point to trouble in your gut, which means harder work for your immune system, not to mention your mood, because many of your neurotransmitters are, of course, manufactured by your gut. 99.9% of the probiotic products on the market die in your naturally harsh stomach acid before they get to where they're needed. This drives me crazy because for years, I spent so much money on all these really expensive, so I thought, fancy probiotics at the health food store. And even if I walk in the store now, there's that refrigerated section of all these different probiotics and uh, knowing what I know now and Having wasted so much time, energy, and money on them, I kind of laugh and also feel sad for the people who are still getting duped. Uh, Even the supposedly special probiotics in the refrigerated section uh, will not. (laughs) So due to the fact that most probiotics on the market don't do what they're supposed to do once they get in your body, I'm really excited that Just Thrive has solved that problem. Their proprietary strains have been third-party clinically tested and proven to arrive 100% alive in your gut. This makes their probiotic by far more effective than other leading brands. 
So if you're as excited about this as I am and you want to give these spore-based probiotics a shot, here's what you do. Go to justthrivehealth.com slash Luke. That's justthrivehealth.com slash Luke. And if you enter the code Luke15 at checkout, you're going to save 15% off. That's justthrivehealth.com slash Luke. You, my friend, are in for a real treat today. Our guest is none other than Christine Hassler, who is a badass. So get ready for some inspiration. She's also a master coach, facilitator, and speaker with over 15 years of experience. To top that, she's the best-selling author of three books, most recently, Expectation Hangover, Free Yourself from Your Past, Change Your Present, and Get What You Really Want. She's also host of the top-rated podcast, Over It and On With It, where she coaches people live on the show. A very cool podcast, I might add. She has a master's degree in spiritual psychology and implements elements of NLP, psychology, spirituality, science, and a lot of her own diverse life experience into her work. This episode was recorded on location in lovely Austin, Texas, my soon-to-be home. For anyone interested in how to live a spiritual life while being successful in your career at the same time, this is going to be the episode for you. Christine happens to be one of my favorite people in the world and brings so much wisdom to the conversation. Here's just a taste of the nuggets dropped in this episode, why she bailed on her lucrative Hollywood career as an agent to pursue her passion for personal development, how to manifest without needy attachment, building self-love and worthiness to get what you want rather than fighting for it, what happens when your life purpose and career don't match, the practice of acceptance, surrender, and stillness, overcoming self-sabotage and procrastination, the root causes of people-pleasing and how to overcome it, And finally, how to manage work-life balance and so much more. Now, before we jump into this conversation with Christine, I want to make sure that you reach down to your device and click subscribe on the podcast app you're listening to my voice on. Now, seriously, just take a moment right now, scroll down, ding, 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 click subscribe. When you do that, and if you do that, it not only helps you stay informed of upcoming episodes, but also helps this podcast reach more people. So please make sure to subscribe. Got a couple episodes to announce for you. This Friday, we've got an incredible episode called the Joe Dispenza Advanced Retreat Play-by-Play Field Report featuring myself and my partner, Allison, wherein we do daily reports live from Marco Island, Florida, where we were recently involved in the Joe Dispenza Retreat along with today's guest, Christine, as crazy as that might seem. So that's this Friday, a bit of a bonus episode there, but one you are sure to enjoy. Then we'll be back next Tuesday with The Conscious Entrepreneur, A Gamified Life Where Everyone Wins with my friend, Drew Canoli. That one was recorded out in uh, Sedona. So we've been on quite a tour the past past, uh, few months here on the show. And then finally, February 23rd, 2021, Christine will be back on the show for an episode called Higher Love, The Relationship Roundtable with Allison Charles, Stefano Stefandos, and Christine. That's episode 332. So we've got three great shows coming up after the one you're about to listen to. See why I recommended that you subscribe? You don't want to miss any of these shows if you're ready to take your life to the next level. All right, that's enough out of me. Let's jump into this incredibly inspiring conversation with Christine Hassler. Enjoy the show and make sure to share it with a friend. All right. All right. Here we are. Here we are. We meet again. I'm so excited to see you. Likewise. Was Dispensa the last... Time mm-hmm. I saw you? Wow. Palm Springs. Wow. Yeah. It's and that's when I had first started dating Allison. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And we uh, we went out to eat and um, yeah, it was an exciting time. And I was so excited because I knew her well through through Instagram. Yeah. So I knew her through my phone. But I was yeah. like, that's an awesome match. And it, and it was really actually... And we'll, I don't want to get into relationships because we're going to do we're another do podcast. So I, as I was preparing my manuscript, I was like, no relationship <laughs> stuff, Luke, save it. <laughs> But it was actually really expanding for me to to go eat with you two mm. and just to witness like a conscious, you know, evolving couple mm-hmm. is really inspiring. Mm-hmm. Thank you. That's, yeah, because that's one thing that's um, a challenge, I think, for many people is you're really committed to your path and yep. you might meet someone that you like or love and they're on a different path. It's hard. <laughs> I've been there. <laughs> yeah, I have too. So yeah. I was like, you know, seeing you guys do your work together and helping people and mm. serving based on your gifts and your wisdom was really neat. Yeah. I held out yeah. for almost a decade for him. <laughs> I waited because I, I mean, you know, I was divorced and then 
thought I'd find somebody pretty quickly after that. I never thought it'd be a decade, but it was almost a decade, but it was worth the wait. Because to have someone that I can, one, just totally be me and I don't have to hide any of my woo-woo stuff or any of my psychology (laughs) stuff or pretend is great. And then to have someone that, you know, values what I do so much is is everything. Yeah, Yeah. it is. It's fun. It's fun. I'm experiencing that too. Mm -hmm. There's one thing you said, and I'll probably repeat this uh, in our podcast, but I've quoted you so many times. And I think the first time I quoted you, I was like, who was that? (laughs) And then eventually (laughs) I was like, oh yeah, it was Christine. But we were talking about um, the feeling you get when you meet someone. Yeah. And just the nature of codependent, addictive relationships and all of that stuff, which I've um, explored uh, ad infinitum. <laughs> and you said, you know, Luke, when you meet the right person, it just feels like you said, oh, I think you said, um, it doesn't feel like a drug. Right. Yeah, it doesn't it feels, feel like fireworks. It yeah. feels like home. Mm-hmm. I was like, oh shit. Mm-hmm. Like I used to think that sounded, would have sounded boring. <laughs> <laughs> no, like, but where's that, the high? <laughs> yeah. But having enough experiences where it felt like a drug, yeah. both the good parts and the downside of uh, drugs. Yeah. Um, you know, I thought, wow, yeah. And and it was starting to shape up that I had mm. that sense with Allison mm. and, and what you described of just really being able to be your fullest, most brilliant, sloppiest self yep. and just get nothing but unconditional love in return for that is pretty magical. It really is. Yeah. So really anyway, is. we'll we'll get into that. Yeah. Uh, I want to start, I've been listening to your podcast a lot, mm. which I always do, you mm. know, before I'm going to interview someone, I just consume any content they have. Mm. And um, I was listening, you know, you commute quite a ways here in Austin, you know, if you're <laughs> staying in the outskirts. So I can get a podcast in just about everywhere I go. But um, I was really enjoying the coaching ones that you mm-hmm. do with people, mm-hmm. you know, and I was really getting a sense of your gifts and wisdom. Mm-hmm. And um, based on that, it was like going to be such an easy conversation for mm-hmm. me. And unlike most podcasters, I typically kind of skip people's origin stories. Great. Because I just think... I don't know. I just get bored, I guess, because I already know it because I've researched the person. (laughs) So unless there were like key nuggets or takeaways that I just have to throw in there to create context, I typically just kind of like get right into your knowledge base. But um, I did want to briefly touch on your former career in Hollywood because Mm. I feel like we're both sort of refugees of that that, that world, right? And um, yeah, I was in it for, oh God, like 17 years. Mm. Mm. And um, I think you moved there when you were 20. Yeah. Well, and I was in it before that. So I was an actor as a kid. Oh, okay. Yeah. And so I grew up in Dallas and there was this place called the Young Actor Studio. And I, and the reason my parents got me into acting is because there was a lot of teasing at school and, and I Hate Christine Club was started and I just didn't have friends. And they saw me just start to really wither away and get depressed and was put on antidepressants and they thought acting might be something where I could, you know, find my voice again. And it was a really good call by my parents. And I was resistant at first because I was so insecure. But when I got into acting and someone gave me lines to read, it was like it took the pressure off of being me because I just didn't like me. I thought me had no value in the world. But I would read those lines. I could be somebody else. I could be funny or I could be dangerous or I, I could be all these different people. And I loved it. I loved it. And I think when we love something and it also gives us such a relief, we tend to be kind of good at it. And so I ended up getting scouted in Dallas because the woman who ran the studio would bring in agents and casting directors and spent a couple summers out in um, the Valley in Hollywood um, doing auditions and all kinds of stuff. But eventually I realized... You know, rejection was so hard for me. Rejection is my core wound. <laughs> oh my God. If you want to be an actor, totally. rejection, 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 and more rejection. And rejection, and they give you reasons too. Like your hair is the wrong color. You're too fat, you're too thin. You're too tall. It's like really hard. And after doing that for a while, I, was, I just said, I can't do this. It's too much. But I still love this craft and I love this industry. So then I went to college and decided to go behind the camera and pursued a career in production and eventually agents. Yeah. And um, eventually I'm assuming you found, and, and this isn't true for all people because yeah. I, I'm a, you know, a huge fan of film and, and the arts and all of that. And Hollywood does produce a lot. But I think when you get behind the scenes in Hollywood, it's pretty creepy. It's, it, <laughs> like, it's, it's difficult, I think, for people that aren't in it to understand like 
the politics yeah. and and just so much of the depraved nature of, of the the industry and where it where it's located and the whole thing. It's just um, it's hardcore. I think the, the further I got away from it, the more I realized, like, wow, I was involved in a really weird industry. It is. It's it's so magical in so many ways, and like you said, there's incredible things about it. And, but I think about me and the reason I was drawn to Hollywood. So I was drawn to Hollywood because I was desperately insecure and wanted to prove myself to the world. Like that was one of the things that drove me to this industry. And I think that drives a lot of people. So you've got a lot of insecure people looking for a way to fill a void. And that's going to create a lot of issues. And, you know, I was, I was only like, I moved out there when I was 20. I quit my job at like 25. So I was only in it five years, but I dated at the time a really big wig in Hollywood. So I really got to get in and see. And at first I thought, oh, wow, this is so cool. I'm meeting all these celebrities. But it also was like pulling the curtain back on the Wizard of Oz and going, oh, wait, these people are just as messed up inside as I am. Like there's no hope for me down this road. So that was part of, you know, really seeing that was part of what eventually made me leave the industry. Because I was like, I don't think this is the answer. This isn't the answer to what I'm looking for. This isn't going to be the thing that all of a sudden makes me feel better about myself. I'm going to kind of speed to the end of the story okay. <laughs> and ask you, I think, uh, a really important question for so many people right now that have had their lives overturned by COVID mm. and so many people are without work and uh, you know the world and, and this country are just kind of upside down. And I think a lot of people are probably have either lost their job or career or mm -hmm. are really realizing as they've been working from home or working remotely, et cetera, or have been considered non-essential that what they were perhaps doing for work was not their true calling and their yeah. mission and passion. And I know you do a lot of coaching to help people discover what that is. Mm -hmm. What would be sort of an overview of your blueprint for finding out what mm -hmm. your, your true purpose is here on the planet? Mm -hmm. And A, and B what about those people who perhaps have a grandiose idea about what their purpose <laughs> yeah. is? Like I, I think I talked about on a show the other day, I call it the, uh, the American Idol syndrome where like, I'm the best singer in the world. Right. And everyone in the room is like, oh my God, no, you're yeah. tone deaf. Like <laughs> you're not going to make it as a singer. So I think that's something that's yeah. kind of a two-parter there yeah. is, you know, like how can we really zero into what our unique gift mm -hmm. is? And then also reconcile that what we're passionate about might not be the thing we're most talented at right. or have an aptitude for becoming highly successful in. Well, that was a big question. You might have to remind me of some of those parts, but it was like, I think I, I got A and B mostly. Yeah. <laughs> I'll start with A and then you, right. can, you can help me. So for me, the purpose of our life is not tied to a career at all. And I think this is where a lot of us get off track and where a lot of us suffer in terms of our career because we're, we think that our purpose on the planet is to do something or to be something. And what I've learned over the years, often the hard way, is that really our purpose is to grow our consciousness. Our purpose is to return more and more to love, move away from fear into love, deprogram a lot of the beliefs that got programmed early, heal some of the wounds, really evolve our consciousness and, and have our soul. And if you don't like the word soul, you can just think of like your, your higher self really evolve so that things that bothered you five years ago don't bother you today. That really is the purpose, growth and evolution. Our career is an expression it's just something we get to play with, just like we get to play with relationships and we get to play with uh, enjoying amazing food and we get to play with travel. It really is an expression. Now that said, I know that having a fulfilling career is really important. Like no one wants to go to a job that's toxic every day. No one wants to go and just sit and just be miserable every day. And so it's like, how do we find that, that sweet spot between knowing that we can't find the, the purpose of our life and our career but we also want to be satisfied. So there's a couple ways I like to explore it. He said the word passion. So if we look at the original definition of the word passion, do you know what it is? Suffering, passion of the Christ. So the actual origin of that word is passion. If you think of co co compassion, it's co means with, passion means suffering. So when we're being compassionate, we're being with someone suffering. So we've evolved this word passion over the years to mean this thing that we love to do. And it clicked for me when I was like, wow, this thing that I love to do, coaching and facilitating, helping people really grow, comes from my suffering. 
I never would have gotten into this work if it hadn't been for my own suffering, my own struggles, my own heartbreak. Personal development was never something I pursued because I wanted it to be my career. It was because I needed a way out of my own suffering. So often how we find our passion in life or even our purpose is to look at our suffering. What are the things that we've really struggled with? What are the things that we've gotten to the other side of that make us guides in a lot of ways and that make us really connected to it? Because when we feel so connected to something, it feels more purposeful. So that's always a really good place to look. Where have you suffered? What are the things that you've gotten to the other side of? What is the wisdom you've gained? And how can that translate into, you know, it doesn't have to be, all right, well, I've struggled so much with my life. I'm going to become a coach or a therapist. You could just think of certain lessons that you've learned. Maybe because of that, you're naturally just empathetic. So you want to do things that involve people and that that involve understanding people. Maybe you've had to figure out a lot of stuff out in your life because your parents weren't around and you had to like fend for yourself. Maybe you want to do something where you're a really good problem solver. So we can start to connect the dots. And another place to really look is what we love to do as a kid. Our, our inner child is so wise and we are so tapped in to our truest gifts when we're little. What, what did you like to do as a kid? Just out of curiosity. The thing that came to mind right away, and it's funny because we were talking about hunting mm. uh, moments ago before I recorded, but when I was a kid, um, I, I lived in the country. This is very much like where we are here is like mm. where I grew up in Northern California and also lived in Colorado and Idaho. So I grew up in the country and it was um, catching animals and not killing them. Yeah. I actually didn't like killing them. Mm. Even fishing when I was a little kid, I was mm-hmm. just, I was soft. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'd be like taking the, even if you catch and release, like taking the hook out, I'm like, I think his gills are ruined. Like oh, no. I'm a bad person. Uh, but my dad was a really rugged hunter fisher. Mm-hmm. So the way to spend time with my dad was to interact with nature. Mm. And even though I didn't like killing things, I like catching them and playing with them. Mm-hmm. Why did you, what did you like about catching and playing? Um, I think it's just an innate human um, tendency to hunt and capture mm-hmm. creatures, probably mm-hmm. for the purpose of eating them. Mm-hmm. But when you have a McDonald's down the road, yeah. you know, uh, you don't need to eat the gopher snake that you caught under a log in the apple orchard. Yeah. Uh, I think it was just like that connection to nature and just mm-hmm. my fascination with all of the different species of animals that exist out there and, and the way that they look and move and, and act and... See, curiosity, evade. right? Yeah. yeah, there you go, yeah. And that's so much what you do now. Yeah. Like that, now you catch podcast guests. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a little different. He's not going to yeah. let me out, guys. <laughs> and and you're you're curious about it, and you're it's that fascination. So and true. So it's like what there's always clues. There's always clues. So those are the kind of questions we can ask ourselves. What's been my suffering? What have I learned from that? How can I evolve my suffering into things that I love? What are the things that I love to do as a kid? And it's not a direct translation. It's like if you love playing fireman, it doesn't mean you go be a fireman. But what did you love about that? And can you extract those qualities? Because so often we're pushed into a career path by expectations. Pressures from our parents, pressures from society, fears about money. If we grew up in a lot of scarcity, we saw our parents struggle. It's like, oh, I can't possibly pursue art because my parents struggled. I better go to law school. You know, So oftentimes we choose these paths based on fears based on unresolved issues, based on things other people told us. And then we reach this point where we're you know, 10, 20, 30 years into a career going, who am I? Like, how did I get here? And then the bigger question, how do I get out? Because it's become such a comfort zone. You know, That's the hardest thing with career transition is jumping into uncertainty. Actually, it's the hardest thing in just life. It's just jumping into any uncertainty. I think we're seeing that so much this year, people are just massively triggered by the amount of uncertainty. And we're realizing, wow, like we really don't do well in mass uncertainty. So that's, that's you know, when we're thinking about making a career transition, we've got to be okay with the uncertainty and know that, you know, we may not jump from a job we hated right into a job we love. It might be, you know, when I was little and I used to cook spaghetti, I'd throw noodles against the wall. And if it stuck, it was done. If not, more time. And Sometimes it's like that. You just throw a bunch of noodles against the wall and, and see what sticks. And I know people listening are like, well, I have to pay my bills. And you know, I went through that too when I did the job transition from Hollywood into what I did now. I was a hand model. I was a personal trainer. I worked for another company. I did bookkeeping. I did whatever I could to start to build this up. So sometimes we need those jobs that just give us a security when we're building something we love. It just doesn't happen overnight. Yeah. Yeah, I I think there's a lot of great information in there. Um, 
first thing that struck me was that our purpose doesn't necessarily equate to what we do for work. Mm -mm. And I think that that's something that's would be difficult for me to accept doing something that is not my true deepest passion for a job and having to relegate my passion slash purpose into yeah. something that's a hobby. I think that's something difficult for people to reconcile. Yeah. So it's like, how do you find a vocation that you don't totally hate? <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. That you feel like you're making a meaningful contribution to society and you're paying your bills, taking care of your family, yourself. But at the same time, knowing that like, that's what you do, that's not who you are. And that distinction mm-hmm. of, I mean, for me, I view my purpose here um, in so much the same way. And that is like, I'm going for enlightenment. I want to evolve as much as humanly yep. possible while I'm here in this realm, in this body. And um, you know, a lot of it's just, I don't want to keep having to go through this go through karmic the same cycle. thing over and over again. I'm yeah. not doing this so again. I'm, yeah, It's like here to learn and to evolve and to change. Mm-hmm. And so I think I am fortunate in that a lot of what my career now entails mm-hmm. uh, is actually just doing that work with myself and yep sharing what I find to be uh, meaningful and successful with other people. Well, here, here's one thing I've noticed that may uh, fill in some gaps here. A lot, I mean, I've been coaching people for 16 years. So I've noticed a lot of patterns over the years. And I've had a lot of people come to me because they're miserable in their career. And they come to me because they say, I need to help me figure out what I want to do with my life. I'm like, sure, we'll eventually get there, but we're going to start with your childhood and we're going to start with how you got here. You know, before we look at where we want to go, we have to look at how did we get to where we are? Because if we just want think about, okay, how do I get to where I want to be? And we don't look at where we've been, we're just going to be in a loop. We're just going to repeat things. We'll maybe get the next job that we think is great, but we have a toxic boss again, or we're not making the money we want or, you know, so on and so forth. So people come, they say, I want a career change. And I say, let's, let's dig a little. Let's look at how you got here. Let's look at some limiting beliefs. Let's look at the patterns. Let's look at the unresolved stuff. Let's look at emotions that you swept under the rug 20, 30 years ago and you still haven't lifted it up and just swept more under there. And what I've seen is that as people make their own evolution and their own healing, their purpose, just let the job be what it is, naturally, by default, another opportunity comes or they have an insight or because they've transformed, the people they work with aren't bugging them as much, or all of a sudden they get that promotion, or they have a new relationship to their job. So this looking at our purpose being that evolution and that development, it handles so many other things in our life. I mean, I've really built my career. Yes, I've done things and done like linear plan-based goal-oriented things, but most of it has come from making my number one purpose, my own healing and my own evolution. And as that happens, different opportunities come in, different insights come in. And it's so out of the way we're taught. You know, we're taught work hard, do this, have a plan that to go into, oh, if I just work on myself, things may start working out. That's a big leap for people to make. But I really see that as one of my purposes is being like, all right, I know you're here and you want to get here, but you're not going to get here the same way you got there. So we've got to find another route. And often it is going inside and doing that work that can be really terrifying and really confronting and can kind of go, I just wanted to change my career. Now I'm dealing with what happened to me at six years old. Like, I just want this to stop. I just want a different job. But that different job is never the answer to the problem. You know, anybody right now that's miserable in their job, I would question you and really ask, like, where else are you miserable? Like, where else are you not being authentic? Where else have you said yes when you really meant no? Where else are you not speaking your truth? We don't just end up somewhere without any reason for being there. And when we can take real personal responsibility, not total self-blame, but just responsibility. So we move out of victim and start to realize, wait a second, like I do have some choices here. Even if I can't change my job right now because I have to pay my bills, I have a choice in how I relate to it. I have a choice in how much I complain about it. I have a choice in how much I blame others about it. So we always have choice. That's really good. So it's like um, being in a situation in your life and career that's unsatisfactory 
seems like it's the root of your problem, right? Because every mm-hmm. day you're going in like, oh God, here I am in the cubicle again or whatever your situation happens to be. So it seems like I just need to fix this exterior thing exactly. and then I'll feel contentment and all will be well. But really it's about the root cause of what ended you up in a situation uh, that is unhealthy for you. Exactly. I mean, I had an amazing life at 25. I had a job people work years for. I was dating somebody that could give me access to anything. I was hanging out with celebrities. I was making stupid money for a 25-year-old. And I still wasn't happy. And I'm so glad I learned that at a young age of like, the answer is never in someone or something else. Those things never make us happy. Sure, there are things that are more aligned that can bring us way more enjoyment. I mean, we were talking earlier about a relationship that's not a fit versus a relationship that is. Big difference. But a lot of that is because of who we're being. You know, you found a lot of your own answers inside before Allison came along. Same with me with Steph. And, And same with my career. Like I had to get to a place where I was really like okay with me before I started having a career I really, really love. So you're absolutely correct from my opinion, from my point of view. Like we look to the exterior, it's such a human thing. We look to the exterior to either Mm -hmm. blame or to make us feel better. And it's neither one of those things. Yeah, that's the lowest hanging fruit. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just you, you, you're uncomfortable by some parameter in your life. And it just seems like if you fix that surface thing, then you'll solve your problems. Yeah. And, you know, also in the kind of in the, um, you know, the side hustle transition to, I think that the um, initiative that it takes to make that change does come from the inner growth, right? So when your life is more aligned to your spiritual purpose, then you start to become more curious and more magic starts to happen. You start to manifest different relationships and be tuned into signs that you're mm-hmm. given. Hey, there's a little nudge, go this way, go that way. And that was my experience with starting this podcast a few years ago mm-hmm. and moving into this health and wellness space as a career. It's not like there was no plan to do that. I just started getting pulled more professionally yeah. into what served, uh, which happened to be for me, the, you know, my life's purpose and career happened to align. But it's probably due to the fact that my life's purpose had become more and more clear. And so there became um, a discord between what I was doing professionally Mm -hmm. to where it just became unbearable, even though it was a job like yours that many people thought, oh my God, that's the coolest coolest job ever. You you know, it's like a shoeshine boy for celebrities, basically. (laughs) They call you a fashion stylist, but really, you know, sometimes you run around buying Spanx, you know, at Target and whatever. Um, Spanx are great. Yeah, so... (laughs) <laughs> but it's just like, you know, at one point I'm going, why am I doing this? This yeah. is not, I'm not really helping people. I mean, I'm yeah. helping someone get through a photo shoot, but it's not really having an impact on their life. So when you asked yourself that question, why am I doing this? Was there an answer? Oh yeah. Like so many of the things I've done. Um, and this goes back to the American Idol syndrome mm-hmm. a little bit too. <laughs> like I used to be a musician and then I would have, you know, a mm. waiter job or... Mm-hmm a number of other illegal jobs that we won't mention here. (laughs) Uh, But it was always about the music. And over time, as I started to work on myself, I realized, yeah, I'm very passionate about music and I love music, but I don't want to do music as a career solely because I love music. I want to do it because my self-worth and my identity was attached to it. And when that didn't pan out and I didn't, I had never made enough money playing music to support myself as even like a broke ass musician, let alone, (laughs) you know, ever hope to buy a home or achieve any of my financial goals. Um, Then I just kind of was uh, haphazardly thrown into the fashion and entertainment industry. Mm -hmm. And that was not something I ever really enjoyed or felt I was particularly great at, but it sounded cool. (laughs) You know what I mean? So as I started to dig deeper, I was like, wow, I, you know, I was, once I stopped playing music, I was like so relieved. And I thought, why am I relieved? I thought I love music. I'm like, no, I, I love music, but I don't love it as a job because my motives for doing it were based on validation. There's so much pressure. Stakes are so much higher when what we're doing is, you know, because the ego is so tied to surviving and how the ego survives is through validation 
through feeling like we belong, feeling like we're somebody, feeling like we have meaning in our life. And a lot of those things are important. I'm not, the ego isn't a bad thing. It's natural. But when that, that validation thing, that's a really big one. And when we outsource that, whatever we outsource it to has the power. So like in that situation, like the industry had the power or the, the gig had the power or whatever it was because we're outsourcing that validation, which is a human need. We need to feel like, hey, you're pretty cool. Like, good job. Like yeah. we, all, yeah. we all need that. It's that when we switch from, I need it from this thing out here to I can really give it to myself and I can get it from people who are my soul family, people I really trust and who really see me and who aren't validating me based on what I do, but just see me for who I am. It's like, oh, that's the validation I was always looking for. I was never looking for, oh, Luke, you're such a great musician. Or, oh, Christine, like you produced a great movie. It was, Luke, I see you and I really, really like you. Period. That's, that's what we're all looking for. But because we don't get a lot of that, especially as children, then we're looking for that thing, like that thing to make me feel like I'm enough. Yeah. Yeah. Show the world that you're, mm -hmm. that you're worthy. <laughs> yeah. It's a human thing. I haven't yeah. met, I've, I've yet to met, meet one person who doesn't deal with the I'm not enough monster. Yeah. yeah. You know, like, and we all have our version of where it shows up in our life. And it's just, so, it still shows up for me. You know, I'm sure there'll be a part of me that watches this podcast and goes, oh, I should have said that. Or that was a stupid thing to say. Or, you know, we have that, <laughs> totally. that inner critic that's like, you didn't do good enough. And we're tied to this part of us that, that beats us up because we think that without that, we'll just crumble. You know, that we need it to move forward or to be better. And what I've learned about the inner critic over the years is that it actually really doesn't make me better. It pushes me not not often not not always to the things that i really want it like pushes me hard but it doesn't make me better what i found actually makes me better and makes me grow is that voice of compassion and so i've had to learn cuz i have I've, i have a fierce inner critic she's better over the years i've i've worked with her but she used to be ruthless ruthless like anything that i did any goal i accomplished i'd celebrate for maybe 0.5 seconds and then it was right into what could have been different or what I could have done better or what the next thing would be. And I've had to learn to work with that inner critic and talk to it because it's we, we tend to think our critical voice is us, but it's not. It's just a voice. And so I've had to talk to that part of me and go, okay, Christine, like being really hard on yourself. Is there another way we could talk about the situation and, and talk back and forth and separate it out so that I could find another voice inside of me? And we can't criticize our inner critic because a lot of times when the critical voice comes up, we're like, oh, I shouldn't judge myself or being mean to myself or there's my inner critic again. And then we're just criticizing the inner critic and we're in a vicious cycle. So I've had to learn to lo even love my inner critic and know on some level, she's just trying to help me. She's just trying to protect me from rejection, protect me from feeling alone, protect me from messing up, protect me from shame or embarrassment, protect me from not living up to my expectations and being disappointed with myself. But I've had to work with that part of me so that I can, I can, do that. I can still protect myself from those things, but in a much more loving way. You mentioned earlier limiting beliefs. Mm. And this is something that I ponder a lot because there's, there's a belief that one can find within themselves through that inner critic, right? Like, yeah. who am I kidding to try to do this as a career? Who am I kidding to try to date that person? Whatever it might be, right? And there's a part of you that's observing that phenomenon of the inner critic. And I would call that a limiting belief because it's something that you're yeah. aware of and it's a belief system. It's something you hold to be true, whether or not it is. But underneath that is this, and you, you, you mentioned the word shame too. Underneath that, you know, uh, for those of us that had challenging childhoods, which is probably 99.9% .9 of the population, yeah. <laughs> there's something that's below a belief and it's a felt sense yeah. of not being worthy. Even if, you know, in a cognitive way, we're thinking, no, oh, I'm a good person. Like I'm good looking. I'm yeah. successful. Like there's all the boxes might be checked, but for so many of us, myself definitely included, mm. there's an underlying sense of not being deserving mm. of love or of success mm -hmm. or whatever it is that, you know, a healthy, fully integrated human being mm -hmm. would be able to cultivate and manifest in their life. Mm -hmm. I think in a lot of the personal development and manifestation, uh, success-driven teachings, 
it often has a hard time getting at the root, like way, yeah. way underneath there. And that's been definitely true for me. And I've I've you know, done a lot of deep mm-hmm. excavation in the past couple of years and I've moved mountains with the assistance of plant medicines and all sorts mm-hmm. of things that have just really, really moved the needle for me. Uh, but what do you teach or recommend for people to get underneath that mm. conscious belief into that felt sense of who we are and, and, and in that finding that sense of deserving and self-worth that we might be able to build a life on top of and not feel like we're a fraud? Yeah. Great question. So I think that at the core of that belief of not being deserving or I'm not enough is because there's a separation from God or from love or from source, whatever we want to say. Like, I'm sure you've had plant medicine experiences where you've really felt unconditional love and you felt that God energy. And you're like, oh, I'm so loved. I finally get it. And as babies and as children, we're still really tapped into that. We're still really tapped into that. I'm just going to use God energy, insert whatever word works for you. And then life happens and that cord starts to get fuzzier. And eventually a lot of us, especially if our innate relationship with God and our spiritual self isn't nurtured, it, we, we lose that connection. So who do we project God on? Mom and dad. They become God. They become the two people or whoever was your primary caretaker that you're looking for, for that love. Because think of it, when we come into this world as new souls, we just come from this world of so much love and we come into the human world. And so we're still looking for that unconditional love and deservingness. So it's like, oh, you two people will give it to me or who, whoever is that parental role. And so when that person, mom or dad, doesn't love us that way or see us that way, it's devastating. And we take everything so personally as children. I mean, as adults, we can start to separate some things. Like if somebody says something crappy to us, we can kind of go, oh, they're having a bad day, not take it personally. But as children, especially from our parents, anything they say or anything they do, they could get divorced and tell you it wasn't your fault, but still on some level, you believe it was. So it's like anything is taken so personally and we're just looking for that love. We're just looking for that unconditional, I want to know I'm enough. I want to know I matter. And so to me, that's really at the core of most people's issue is there's certain things that happened in your life that made you go, oh, wait, I'm not safe. Oh, wait, I really can't be who I am. Oh, wait, I'm, I'm really not enough. And we all have different significant events or it can just be you know cumulative years of having a parent who is emotionally unavailable and feeling like we weren't worthy enough to have their attention. But that's really when I work with people and we, we start to get to the core, I start, I really try to help them unpack like what were some of those early life experiences that made you start to feel like you weren't lovable, that you weren't enough in some way. Because as kids, there's what happens and then there's the meaning we give it. And as kids, if we had, let's say an emotionally unavailable mom or an alcoholic father, we couldn't say, oh, well, she didn't get the love she needed as a child. And so she just can't love me or he just has too much stress in his life and can't handle his feelings. So he's drinking. We can't make sense of it as children. We just think something's wrong with us. So we've always got to go back. That's why I'm such an advocate and teacher of inner child work, of going back to our childhood and giving ourselves what we didn't get. So what that looks like, and let me just preface this by saying, you don't have to remember your childhood to do inner child work. That's the number one question I get when I talk about inner child work. People say, I have no memories of my childhood doesn't matter because whatever you're feeling now, anxiety, not enoughness, low self-worth, overwhelm, scarcity, you felt as a child. So all you have to do is sort of ride those feelings back in time to your childhood. And if you don't, even if you don't remember the actual events that were happening, you can connect with that little one inside of you and give her or her the chance to express feelings. Is this making sense so mm-hmm. far? Mm-hmm. So what that looks like is actually going back to maybe when we were three years old or four years old, if you know that was a time when, let's say you had a sibling born and all of a sudden you went from being the center of attention to the attention got diverted. And all of a sudden you started feeling not enough 
or you started feeling like there was more pressure on you to be good because there was a baby. There's, there's all kinds of things that happen in our childhood. We can go back to that three or four-year-old, even if we don't have the memory, we kind of know what happened and just connect in and be like, how are you doing? How are you feeling? Because as children, we're not really asked a lot. How are you doing? How are you feeling? What's going on in there? Oh, you're angry? Okay, be angry. That's okay. I'm here. Be as angry as you need to be. Do you want to hit that pillow? Do you want to make some sounds? Go for it. We usually get, be quiet. Don't, you're too loud. Be a good girl. Be a good boy. Or there's so much chaos in our house, we have to stuff all our emotions inside. So we don't really get the opportunity as children to really emote and really express what's going on. We don't feel safe enough to do that. So that's such a, such a big part of personal development and really healing. I call it more healing than personal development. It's going back and talking to the inner child and letting ourselves have feelings that we never had and being that loving parent to that inner child. That is like the sweet spot of really being able to change your life is when triggers come up, because most triggers have nothing to do with what's going on in present time. (laughs) They're always tied back to something. I won't say always, most of the time tied back to something. And if we can find that inner parental voice, it's like, I'm here. I love you. You're safe. I got you. What are you feeling? What is this reminding you of? That's my favorite question to ask anybody when they're triggered is, what is this reminding you of? That's good. Because I it's, like that. it's like in that moment, there's what's happening and <laughs> we're so really mad good. at what's happening. I'm yeah. like, what does this remind you of? That's when have really you good. felt I like this I wish I would have known that last night because <laughs> Alice and I had a moment last night and um, I mean, it, you know, it's a be- it's rare that we have a moment mm. and when it is, it's we're usually laughing about it yeah. within a short period of time. <laughs> And then seeing what it was, but that that would have been a great question last night because uh, it happened to be that I was the one that was in error, <laughs> you know, and uh, <laughs> having that pointed mm-hmm. out. And um, but I didn't think the punishment fit the crime, you know. Basically, yeah. like I had I had just been spaced out, forgot to include her in a text thread, and yeah. things got wonky, and yeah, and it had hurt her feelings, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. You know, she's probably in here going, "Can you stop sharing about every detail of our personal life?" <laughs> um, but you know, in that, yeah in the talk, uh, you know, I'm sitting there thinking, what the fuck, man? Mm-hmm. Like I didn't do anything. Mm-hmm. I got something. It wasn't like I was maliciously, you know, attempting to exclude someone mm-hmm. from the plan or not, you know, yeah. whatever. I'm generally pretty thoughtful, especially about someone I care so deeply about. Um, but we both, you know, eventually arrived at, oh, you know, use the words, oh, that's reminding me of this, mm-hmm. but we're able to get to what was underneath that. And yeah, once I could see, you know, for in her experience, what was underneath that, it was so easy for me to see, oh yeah, duh, of course. Exactly. Of course that was her feeling experience that makes total sense logically now. We're in the moment, you know, typical mm-hmm. like male, female brain in the moment. I'm like, this makes no mm-hmm. sense. You know, mm-hmm. I'm trying to be compassionate, but I'm like, you're nuts. Like I didn't do anything wrong, you know? Yeah. But seeing what it perhaps reminded her of or what was underneath that, um, you know, you're just, you're instantly in that place of compassion and empathy and then can see oh, okay, I can see how that situation was perceived as such. Yeah. And there's so much healing and forgiveness within that. Well, and, and it was felt that way. Like if it hit a trigger, so if that was you and me in that situation, it would hit the trigger of middle school and being left out of anything, everything, not invited to parties and feeling like I wasn't likable. It would have hit that trigger. So, and we know when we're, we're triggered when our reaction doesn't quite match the circumstance. <laughs> when it's like a little bigger than what's going on. It's like, oh, why am I getting so upset about this? It really isn't that big of a deal, but it's a really big deal. Yeah. That's when we know, boom, trigger. Like, yeah. Go for, we see what this we really reminds That's you really of. That's really funny because I find a lot of the time when I get triggered, it's like I become frustrated because things aren't working. But my mm-hmm. triggers don't usually include other people. It's like inanimate objects and technology mm-hmm. and just time and over, you mentioned overwhelm. Mm-hmm. It's mm-hmm. more of that. You know, it's like I find myself triggered by just circumstances. Right. That are annoying because I'm trying. Right. To, I'm trying to get something done and like you know make shit happen. Yeah, and um and and things are not going along with whatever my schedule happens to be. You know, right. and um so that's funny. I'm going to start inquiring with myself. What is this? Yeah, what does it of? remind you of that that feeling overwhelmed as a kid or feeling like you do everything on your own? I just got it. Mm. It's not being in control. Mm-hmm. Yeah, when mm-hmm. things are not in my 
proposed time schedule and done with the precision of excellence and perfection yeah. that I demand out of every situation I'm involved in. <laughs> you know, it's a, uh, yeah, <laughs> it's a, yeah, it is. I know. Try living inside this head. Oh my gosh. But, I have my uh, own to deal with. That's okay. <laughs> but yeah. And then it, I can uh, pretty quickly trace that back to, you know, so many situations mm-hmm. in which I had no control over my own circumstances exactly. or safety when I was a kid. And so when I'm in a situation now as an adult and things are spinning out of my perception of control, at least it's frustrating. Yeah. It triggers that little boy inside who's like, things are scary. Things are out of control. I want to feel safe. I want things in control. So when things are controlled, you feel safe. When things aren't, it triggers that little guy inside who's like, who's taking care of me? I'm unsafe. It's chaos right now. So it makes perfect sense. We'll be right back at you after this brief but important announcement. Back in the mid 90s, when I really committed to my own health and recovery, one of the most important parts of that journey was getting into juicing. And I've had a bunch of different juices. I've gone through phases of doing juice fast and then, you know, now spending tons of money at the juice stores because I'm too busy and or lazy to do it myself. But I really believe that extracting the nutrients from nature's abundance of life-supporting plants is really critical to a health regimen. However, it's expensive and inconvenient, or it used to be. Enter our sponsor, Organifi. These guys make some fantastic powdered juice blends and superfood blends that are extremely potent, very well-sourced, very pure, easy to use, delicious, And I've just been a fan of them for many years. So I'm really happy to talk about today's product of choice. It's called Organifi Red Juice. It's got 13 superfoods to support energy in a berry superfood drink. It's 100% certified organic, no caffeine necessary, and just two grams of naturally occurring sugar from the freeze-dried berries. The berry blend that's extremely nutrient-dense and antioxidant-rich tastes delicious and just plain water. You can literally stir it up with a spoon. So I like to use the Organifi Red Juice in that afternoon slump when I start to feel a lull or before a workout. Anytime I feel like I want another cup of coffee, but I probably shouldn't, is a time for Organifi Red Juice. It's also really convenient to use on a go. I'm here recording these plugs right now in Austin, Texas. I've got a bag of the little Organifi Red Juice packets, which is how I had one this morning. And so I really like the fact that they're not only very nutritionally dense, but they're easy to habituate into your life. It's not a hassle. It's not expensive. I don't have to go drop 14 bucks for the same juice at a juice spot and waste the glass and the time and energy. I just walk into the kitchen, pop one of these in a cup, stir it up, and I am done. So that's Organifi Red Juice. If you want to check it out, I highly recommend that you do. And I can't guarantee, of course, because I don't know you personally, but I can almost guarantee that you're going to love it. And as you drink your first cup of Organifi Red, you're going to be thinking, damn, Luke hooked it up. Thank you, Luke. So you can thank me later. But first, you have to go to Organifi.com slash Lifestylist. That's O-R-G-A-N. I-F-I, Organifi with an I, Organifi.com slash Lifestylist. And if you use the code Lifestylist, you're going to save yourself 20% off. That's Organifi.com slash Lifestylist. And now back to the interview. Do you find that men are more resistant to the concept of inner child work or, or have a difficult, a more difficult time accessing that communication? Sometimes, not always. Women have difficulty with it too, especially women who have been reinforced for their smarts and have lived a lot in their mind and a lot in their head. Anyone who has lived a lot in their head and who has just kind of like gone through their life with ever looking behind and going, oh, again, what did I sweep under the rug? Has a hard time with it because so many of us don't remember our childhood. So pretty much most people are resistant to it because they're like, I don't remember my childhood. Like, well, you remember enough, even if you don't have specific memories, you know the context of what's going on. I think the hardest part that I find with men is that for the most part, men are conditioned to be strong and to be resilient and like just to get over things. And women are too, to some extent, but it's, I think, more in the male ethos of like, our just vulnerability is weak kind of thing. And so it's often harder for them to connect to those raw emotions of that little boy. I have three nephews and I have lots of friends who have daughters. And I swear, Luke, the little boys are more sensitive 
they're just so like, the daughters are kind of like sassy and just do their own thing. And the little boys are just so sensitive. And I'm not saying they're weak or crybabies or anything like that. They just, their hearts are just open. And I just pray it stays that way. But to see these little boys and then to work with men, I'm like, wow, men have really had so much of that tenderness and that open heartedness of that little boy conditioned out of them. So that's the hardest part is deconditioning a lot of that. It's not cool to cry. I need to be strong. I need to provide. I, if, I, if I go in... Because that's one fear I hear so many from so many people, especially men. If I go and deal with all this stuff from my past, how am I going to provide still? Like I could fall apart. My whole world could fall apart. That's a big fear. But people find that as they go and deal with that in a healthy way, in a guided way, actually it's easier to provide and it's easier to keep things together. That's an interesting distinction between the sensitivity and vulnerability Mm. between males and females. Mm -hmm. Um, Because I think we have this perception, at least in Western culture, that men are stoic and tough and resilient and women are... Um, emotionally um, driven and... Mm -hmm. Or have more access to our emotions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or just, you know, are more emotionally sensitive, Mm -hmm. et cetera. Um, I used to go see this woman named Dr. Pat Allen. I love Pat Allen. Yeah. And I did some sessions with her and interviewed Mm -hmm. her. I think she was on one of maybe my first 10 podcasts or something. Uh, But she would always talk about at her um, events, she'd do these weekly, you know, kind of meetings that, and I wish I could get the terminology of it, but she basically said, you will never find uh, anyone as tough as a woman and that men are tough physically on the exterior, but incredibly sensitive emotionally and have a much harder time being resilient to emotional pain and, mm-hmm. and, and hurt. Um, whereas women are just more demonstrative about their emotions, but they're actually much tougher inside emotionally and much more resilient. And that used to always strike me because she would repeat it every week in her mm-hmm. little intro monologue. And I thought, what? But no, but, but it's counterintuitive. Yeah. But then as I grew over the years and had more life experience, uh, especially in the realm of relationships, watching how the two genders um, uh, bounce back from heartbreak, then it became more apparent to me that mm-hmm. that men are, you know, I mean, I'm going to say more because there are always exceptions. You can only generalize so much. Mm-hmm. But in my experience, the most guys I know, if they are experiencing betrayal or a loss of a love or something like that, mm-hmm. I mean, it can take them years to come out of it and be kind of ready to get back on the horse. Mm-hmm. And I've observed women that you, they seem on the surface as devastated by a breakup or whatever mm-hmm. it was couple weeks later, kind of <laughs> dust themselves off and they're good to go. You know, and again, I'm generalizing, but it's just, it's mm. something I have observed and it's a curiosity to me because it is counterintuitive. We think like, you know, but guys, we're just not in touch with our emotions and therefore we're invincible. But mm-hmm. I know, man, I feel so deeply yeah. and it's, it's was terrifying for me as an adult dude to become emotionally available Mm -hmm. and vulnerable Mm -hmm. and really authentic and Mm -hmm. yeah and also in of course having the discernment to (laughs) to be able to determine whether or not whomever i happen to be in relationship with male or female um was someone who could hold a safe space for me to do that right yeah and so as i started to kind of stumble (laughs) through my vulnerability (laughs) and authenticity it was like oh yeah. Right approach, wrong person to attempt to, to, it with, yeah. you know. And I like to say, don't go to a Chinese restaurant when you want nachos. Thank like, you. Go to the right yes. person. But yeah, mm-hmm. anyway, it's just it's it's an interesting observation, especially when you're looking at little boys and, mm-hmm. and little girls, and mm-hmm. and you know, having had the experience of without even calling it inner child work, it's just been what's come up. Yeah. Um, for me, there's there has been so much work going back and taking care of that. Yeah, nurturing that part. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And and um and a lot really through ceremony. I mean that's mm-hmm. I, you know I hate to always be the plant medicine guy because mm-hmm. I I also feel a sense of responsibility that I don't think those experiences are for everyone at all times. And um and they can be quite dangerous uh, actually for people that aren't in the right space and the yeah. right set and setting. So I always give that caveat, but I still have to be honest in those situations. Um in particular last year 
Uh, I went to Costa Rica and did uh, four ayahuasca ceremonies mm. there at, at um, Soltara. And a lot of it was around me wanting to really get to the root of some of my blocks and mm-hmm. patterns as an adult, especially in relationships. And um, the main, I mean, there's so many things we could talk for hours and I have already done podcasts for <laughs> hours on it, but based on this, there was this clear realization that um, there were times in my childhood where I was not looked out for yeah. and protected. Mm. Mm. And, and of course, when that happened, then I had to develop my own ways to do that. Yeah. That were extremely destructive yeah, to my own could. moral fiber and to mm-hmm. all relationships and all things, right? Mm-hmm. And so, because at times there was no one around to like take care of that little dude, I developed all these fucked up ways to do that. Yeah. And then had to you know, kind of unravel those and and find healthier ways to do that but still it's like well we still have to learn how to take care of that little guy yep. even though you can heal like the damage that's been done how do you not keep doing that like yeah. where's the adult in the room kind right. of thing right? right and so there was so much work around uh communicating to that little boy mm-hmm. that like i'm the adult in the room now i got you mm-hmm. and it was just whew. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Was and is so incredibly healing. It is, yeah. It's just, I think the realization, like, it's, I get so embarrassed when I cry on my stupid podcast. Oh, I think it's amazing. But people, <laughs> people seem to like it. Maybe they're entertained. <laughs> I mean, well, it's this, real. You know, it's realness. I think we need healing, more. We need you know? more realness. Yeah. But mm-hmm. it was like I'm trying to see if I can articulate it. It was and is the acknowledgement that that little two, three, four, five, six-year-old little Luke, it's not like that's someone I was and that person's gone. Right. He's still in there. That person is totally present right here. Yes. But there's also now an adult with 50 years of experience, wisdom, yes. education, and in, in the art of living life that is in charge of shit now that can... <laughs> handle the parameter and the boundaries and the things that need to take place to keep everyone functional and safe. Mm-hmm. And so it's, um, it's an interesting thing because there's a balance of finding a home within your heart as that innocent, pure self that you still are, Yes. but also having an adult in the room that's able to create a safe life mm. where you can keep that inner child safe in a functional way mm-hmm. that's not limiting mm-hmm. and not based on fear, but just based on discernment, prudence, wisdom, mm-hmm. and gained maturity. Yeah. Yeah. That so re- it's, it's a beautiful experience for me to have mm-hmm. because I never really related to the inner child thing. I was like, cool, I'll go back and like deal with the mm-hmm. childhood trauma heal that and let's keep it moving. <laughs> but I'm going to take the little dude with me. Like we're done. Yeah. Like I'm not that kid Close anymore, that mm-hmm. but you are that kid still. You are. And, and thank you so much for sharing that because I think that was that share was a great explanation of everything that we've been talking about. It's like there was a hurt little boy who felt so lost and who so needed someone. We need as children, someone to take care of us and someone to show us the way. And we don't get that. That's a developmental stage that we miss. So we have to find a way to get it. And we're making these decisions from a place that hasn't developed, right? So, and, and so you, you make quote unquote bad decisions and then we beat ourselves up for those decisions. It's like, no, no, no. That was the best you could do. That was the best you could do given what you had. And we can't beat ourselves up for that. We have to get to forgiveness and go, okay, that was the way I protected myself so far. Now I've got to find a healthy way to do that. I've got to help find a healthy way to make myself feel safe make myself feel like I belong, make myself feel like I matter, make myself feel that I'm nurtured. Because these are all big, big human needs that we have. So I love that. I love that you have a relationship with little Luke and you know that he's in there. All ages are in there. And and then there's the inner parent. There's the inner mother and father. Just like we all have masculine and feminine energies, we all have that inner parent that represents both that healthy mother and father. And we can't look to our biological parents or whoever raised us to give us that. We have to do that for ourselves. And when we do, then not only do we forgive our actions, 
we knowing we did the best we could, but then there's much more healing we can have with our own family of origin and our parents and go, oh, wow, they were really doing the best they could. But before we can get there, we got to get our feelings out about the shitty job that they did do and let our inner child have a voice about that, but eventually get to forgiveness. Because that, that my favorite visual that I've seen, I, I don't know who the artist is, but it's a child sitting in the lap of an adult and then sort of spirits holding them both. And I love that visual because it's like, there's little me that I get to hold and then God or spirit holds me as well. So when my inner parents like, well, who's there for me? That's when I can really go to my spiritual practice and go, the divine mother, father is there for me. Wow. Mm. Love it. Mm. Um, where do I want to go now? So many, so <laughs> many juicy directions. Um. Other than honoring that you are all of your ages in a culminative way now, mm-hmm. uh, what are some other practical ways that people can develop more self-love and self-worth? Because mm-hmm. you know, I think, as, as we alluded to a bit earlier, so many of us feel that sense of lack and that we don't deserve. Yeah. And so it's all of this external validation, accomplishments, success, getting the husband, the wife, the house, the career, et cetera. Um, And even if we do, through our own sheer will, achieve some of those things, there's still that nagging thing that there's something wrong with us, that we don't deserve that. Right. Um, Or that lack of self-worth just undermines everything we do and we sabotage or we're just not in vibrational alignment with those things that we feel we want in our life. So what are some practical ways that we can learn to love ourselves more and identify that. Is it, you know, mm. looking in the mirror and doing affirmations? It's like, mm. what are the practices, the, the mm. practical things that we can do to, to honor ourselves in a more meaningful way? Well, I, I don't think it's a one size fits all approach for everybody because I think that we have to consider what were the ways that we were most hurt or how were the ways we felt the most unloved? And we've got to direct our self-love in that direction. So. An important thing to remember about self-love is it's really not something we need to learn. It's just something we need to remember because love is who we are. Love is the most natural thing that we do. And so that that helps me feel not intimidated by, I've got to learn to love myself. It's like, no, 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 I just need to remember. So a lot of it is just removing a lot of things. It's noticing when we go down that road of self-beat, and criticism and just that that story that runs about how we're not enough and just one hand on our heart, one hand on our belly and just go, stop, not stop, you piece <laughs> of shit. Just stop. This is not the direction I want to go right now. I forgive myself for judging myself and just take a breath because that self-beat and that critical thinking is like a neural highway in our brain and it's well-grooved. So it's just habitual that we just go there over and over and over again. So really good mental activity is just to notice your thoughts, one hand on your heart, this is all about I am love, one hand on your belly, which is I am safe, and just say, stop, it's not the direction I wanna go. Take a breath, forgive yourself because you wanna forgive yourself for judging yourself because one of the ways we forget how to love ourselves is because we're so busy judging ourselves. If like, if I, my native language was Spanish, And then at four years old, I go and only speak English for 40 years. I'm probably going to forget Spanish. I'm going to have to remember a lot, but I'm going to need to stop speaking English so much and go back and learn this other language. So that's a big part of it. Another big part of it for me, which is super simple, is we've got to connect to that little one and that compassion inside. And so a picture, pictures at various ages or a picture. I have one picture probably when I was four that I keep on my phone And if I'm ever in just a place where I'm not in a place of self-love, I will just look at that picture and I'll look into my own eyes. And there's something about connecting to yourself as a child and looking at that picture that just brings you into your heart and elicits so much love and so much compassion. So something as simple as that is great. Other things that I think are important to really nurture that self-love is what do you have in your life that nurtures and soothes you? Because that is a human need we all have. And that's where most um, addictions, eating disorders, where a lot of those get started because the, the person is looking for, how do I 
nurture myself? How do I soothe myself? And if that wasn't provided, if you didn't get nurturing and soothing as a child and you didn't get a lot of pleasure as a child too, you're going to go for something that gives you that fix. What calms me down? What gives me a moment of pleasure? What soothes me? And that's why so many people go to substances and then you have to keep upping the ante because you know you need more to have that feeling. So putting practices in your life that really nurture you, that feel really nurturing, that feel really soothing, learning ways to calm yourself down. You know, one of my favorite things to do when I was dealing with a lot of anxiety is I wrote a script for myself that was calming. That's like, you're relaxing, you're breathing deeply, you're, I can't remember what it was, but it was, and I think, sorry, I wrote it in I am statements. And I recorded it on my iPhone and just listen to my own voice, calming me down. Because whose voice are we listening to the most? Our own. It's incredibly hypnotic. So making audios that you record yourself with the statements that you really want to reinforce to make yourself feel more in love with yourself is so powerful. And just listen to it over and over and over again. And all of a sudden, like your brain starts to go, oh, that's the voice I'm listening to. That's the information I'm listening to. And then we got to take the external actions because again, there's that inner child in us that's always watching us. It's like, what are you doing that's making me feel safe and loved? So we got to look at who are the people we allow in our life? What boundaries do we have? What are we continuing to tolerate in our life? If we're in toxic relationships, if we have no boundaries with people, that's going to bring our self-love way, 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 way down and our self-worth way down because there's a part of us that's like, oh, I'm tolerating the shitty behavior. I must be shitty because this is what I'm tolerating. So that's when we've got to like really drop the people pleasing thing and not care what people think and put some boundaries in place and maybe realize some relationships have expiration dates and it's time to move on. And that is a self-honoring act, not a selfish act. A lot of times when I talk about self-love, people are like, but that's so selfish. I'm like, no, it's self-honoring. You taking care of yourself, you having boundaries, you doing things that really nurture you isn't selfish. That's self-honoring. And when we're remembering how to self-love, we've got to look at, all right, what am I doing in my life that's self-deprecating, that's not self-honoring at all? And how do I have some boundaries and take some actions that really reinforce, hey, I love myself enough to say no to this. I love myself enough to get this person or this action out of my life. So it's a combination. We've got to do the inward things, the talking to ourselves nicely, the connecting with the inner child, the doing the things that nurture and soothe. And we've got to do the outside work and change things in our life. So the part of us that's watching us all the time is going, do you really love me? It's like, oh, all right. She's doing some self-honoring things. I guess I am starting to love myself more. Wow, that's, that's great. Thank you for, for those. Mm. Those are all really doable and practical. I think something that stands out there is the, the creation and uh, practice of boundaries mm. as an act of self-love. It you is. Know, and I remember when I first started to <laughs> finally get over people pleasing and um, learning how to say no to things and not participate in relationships, yeah. et cetera. Um, there was a period in which it was so exhilarating to finally be more honest, <laughs> yeah. you know? Yeah. And to have the courage to just like cut people off and just stand up for myself. That that was this um, kind of pendulum effect mm. where I was like pretty hardcore <laughs> at first, you know. You're like, oh, I'm kind of an asshole now. <laughs> yeah, and I just was like, oh my god, this is so empowering. You know, I'm finally standing up for myself. Um, you know, and then eventually found some balance. But I think the the distinction there for me between an act of being selfish, you know, as some people might perceive boundaries to be, yeah. right, mm-hmm. and self love is. When it's a healthy boundary, I feel this rush of self-esteem. I just feel really good about myself, even if I have to be pretty firm and harsh with the other party, if that boundary involves other people as they normally do. Uh, I don't feel guilty. Like, oh God, I was kind of mean to that person. I actually feel awesome Mm. inside. And I might have been kind of mean because that's what was called for. It was Mm. an appropriate response or or an appropriate response. boundary. And it had to be stated in a way that was firm enough for the other person to hear it and honor it. And um, that's kind of the inner guidance that I use to determine whether or not I'm just being, you know, mean or abusive or excluding someone Mm. out of, you know, uh, a lower 
place or if I'm doing something that is actually a self-love based practice, yeah. it'll feel really good. It's a little bit like, shit, did I really just say that? Did I just stand up for myself like that? But the feeling is not a feeling of guilt. And it's not even when I have had to address someone in a really firm way, it might appear on the surface that it's coming from anger, but I don't feel the emotional hangover that I would mm. if I was just being reactive and spewing mm-hmm. anger on someone to punish them mm-hmm. or acting out of my wound. It's a really interesting distinction there. And I think we, we've come to another distinction between men and women with this one. Oh, I see. Because okay. <laughs> I'm sure a lot of the women listening are going, I feel so guilty when I set a boundary. This is one thing I've noticed. And again, we're making generalizations here, but men tend to be better. They tend to be like, I set the boundary. I did what I did. And like person's upset. I'm okay with it because I did what needed to be done. Right. Women, again, generalization tend to be set the, set the boundary and then feel so guilty and are so worried about how the other person took it. And that's often what stops a lot of people men or women from setting the boundary. They're so worried that the other person is not going to be okay. And that's the thing with setting boundaries. Often the other person isn't. And you can't wait until you know the other person is going to be okay to set a boundary. That's what keeps most people from setting boundaries. It's going to wait more time, more time. And then eventually the person will be okay with it. No, you just have to do it. And then if the other person's upset, you got to let them be upset because if you're setting boundaries, you're probably tiptoeing on codependence or you're already swimming in it. And you're probably in some people-pleasing behavior. And so your learning in that is to deal with the upset. That may be part of the lesson is that you... I mean, I have lots of clients that come to me and they're like, I did it. I set the boundary. I know it was the right thing, but now I feel awful and my mom's so upset and I don't know what to do. And I think I'm going to just call her and tell her, never mind. I'm like, no, stay strong. <laughs> don't cave. Let her be upset. That's part of the enmeshment and the codependence you're breaking with people is knowing, yes, it's my responsibility to speak truth and love. You can, you can set a boundary and still be loving. You, you know, boundaries don't have to come from a place of hate or judgment or anything like that. You can be totally loving and set a boundary. In fact, that's the way I recommend doing it. And then what happens after that is not your responsibility, not at all. And that's that's the lesson for the boundary setter is dealing with someone else's upset and knowing it's not our responsibility. And that's so hard for a lot of people, especially with a parent or someone you really love. You know, with people that you don't have that much attachment or that much history with, a little easier. But when it comes to somebody that's like big in your life, whew, it's it's difficult. And you got to be in that uncomfortable place if somebody's mad at me. And that's got to be okay. That's when we've got to source our self-worth from within because a lot of people that have trouble setting boundaries, they get their worth from other people liking them. So as soon as that boundary is set and someone's upset, it's like, <gasps> where'd my self-worth go? I'm not liked anymore. I'm not seen as like, the person that can handle it all or the person that this person can go to. And so then all the self-worth stuff starts to come up. And then it's like, great, another opportunity to learn and grow. Wow, I love that. Mm. I love that. Yeah, it's um, it's interesting how in my experience when I've had the wisdom and the clarity to create boundaries, boundaries in relationships, which to me just usually means just speaking my truth and then living by that commitment, yeah. right? It's just gaining a bit of integrity. And I think that's maybe, yeah, that's what the feeling is that feels so good when when one finally starts to stand up for themselves. It does because start there's, to feel really good. It's just the feeling of integrity. You're like, yep. yeah, I'm actually saying and acting in the way that is in alignment with my truth. Yeah, And that's a really great feeling. What's interesting about it is that even if feathers get ruffled, I find, you know, in a relationship with someone that you want to keep a relationship mm-hmm. with, but you just need some space, you know, yeah. some space mm-hmm. um, that truth always seems to have the effect of healing everyone. Does eventually. Yeah. Even if the receiver of the boundary gets butthurt and, yep. you know, runs off on fire, even if the relationship between you and that person does not persist in the same way or the same degree of intimacy, uh, or might dissolve completely, there's still a healing effect because when that person gets butt hurt, unless they're just a complete bypasser, they're probably going to have to stop and face the pain of that exactly. perceived rejection and look inside for a moment and go, huh, 
wow, that person just shut my ass down. Like, yep. what is it about me that would elicit that type of firm boundary? Yep. And there's a there's a healing to that if someone's open and available to it. Is there not? Yeah, 1000%. And that's what prevents resentment in relationship. If you don't have boundaries with people and you let them walk all over you or you let them just walk a little bit all over you, you're going to have resentment. It's, it does not lead to a healthy relationship. So setting boundaries is like, this is what I'm doing. And I've even said this to people that I've set boundaries with who I mean a lot to me and I want to have a relationship with. I say, I know this may sound selfish or this may hurt. I am doing this because I love you and because I want a better relationship with you. And they can't always hear that if they're hurt, but then that's their opportunity to really go and heal. You know, there's, there's three ways to have a relationship and it's, I, I, I like to use the visual of a sliding glass door. So with a sliding glass door, you have all the way shut, all the way open, or the screen. And all the way open is people pleaser, walk all over me. I have so little self-worth that just what I have no boundaries in my life. And then sometimes those people can go to, I'm just going to slam the damn door shut completely so nothing gets in. That's barriers, not boundaries. Nothing gets in. No fresh air gets in. Nothing gets in. But the boundaries is a screen where it's like, oh yes, the sound of birds, a breeze, but let's keep the mosquitoes out. Let's just have a nice relationship here. And that's really what boundaries are. Like, It lets the good stuff flow and it keeps some of the stuff that puts us in unhealthy dynamics with people out. And like we've talked about, they can, it can be hard to close that screen door. But if you've got that sliding glass door all the way open, eventually you're going to get to a point where you're just going to want to slam it shut and the relationships in your life are going to be really challenged. Do you think that uh, resentment is always the end result of people pleasing? In other words, like... Either resentment of others or of self. Yeah, right. Yeah. It's either I'm mad at everybody else or... I was just talking to a client today who is really discovering just years and years and years of people pleasing. And she's like, I'm so angry at myself. I'm so mad at myself. I was like, all right, well, let's, let's work with that. But eventually what she got to is that these years of people pleasing, it was like a total lack of self-love and a self-betrayal. She's pleased all these other people and she's put everyone ahead of her and her and that little girl inside of her is going, what about, why am I last on the list? And we are often so good at loving others and so good at being compassionate with others, so good at being there for others, but we often suck at it for ourselves. So that's another self-love tip, like especially for the parents out there. Or, or pet owners or whatever, people that you care, if you have things that you take care of, you're good and nurturing that, that child or that pet or whatever it is, turn that on yourself. And that's some of the, I think the parenting paradigm we're moving out of is some of the parenting paradigms for years was like, put all my energy and love into this kid. And I think even some people have children because they want unconditional love. They want something to love them so bad. I noticed people that had anxious attachment styles growing up really want to have a baby because there will be something that they just can have and will be there forever. And we're moving more into, you no, know, I'm going to really love myself first. This child isn't mine. It's my responsibility to hold a loving environment, but I'm not going to love myself through that child. I'm going to love me. I'm going to teach that child to love him or herself. And we're going to share in love together. So it's a much different way to hold any relationship, especially the parent-child one. What are the attachment styles that people mm. have and how does one learn what they are um, as they play out in their own life? Like I have no idea what mine is, oh, really? for example. Oh, well, we could figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> so there are basically four. So the secure attachment style is when, I mean, it's pretty obvious you had a secure attachment. So your parents weren't perfect. They made mistakes, but if they made the mistake, they repaired. For example, your dad was 20 minutes like picking you up to the soccer game. He was really sorry when he got there. I'm sorry I kept you waiting. You must have been scared. I'm really sorry. And it didn't happen. It didn't happen over and over and over again. So with secure attachment style, there's some consistency. You knew your parents loved you or you knew whoever raised you loved you. you there was consistency. They did what they said they were going to do most of the time. And there was an emotional availability. You could feel that they loved you. You could feel the connection. Again doesn't have to be perfect, but it's consistent. And then you've got the anxious attachment style, which is where there's inconsistency. So someday you show up to mom and she's in a great mood and wants to play. And other days you show up and it's like, 
mom's in a mood and you know you accidentally broke a dish and you're in massive trouble. So you kind of don't know where you stand and it makes you feel very anxious. That's anxious attachment style. The other side of anxious attachment is when there's an enmeshment with the parent. So the parent is like so in your life and watching your every move and maybe fulfilling some of their emotional needs through you. So it creates a codependence that's, that's also tied into an anxious attachment style. Then we've got the avoidant attachment style. And that's when you can just think avoidant attachment style is neglect. So maybe parents were there physically. They maybe weren't abusive, but they just weren't available. They weren't emotionally present. You just had to figure a lot out on your own. Most people with avoidant attachment styles felt like they were grownups by the age of six and just felt like I'm on my own. And it creates a, a sense of distrust of people in relationship. It's like, keeping people at a distance. And then the disorganized attachment style is just when you grew up in utter chaos. Tons of abuse or alcoholism or just chaos, chaos, chaos. And you just don't know sort of where you are. So any idea which one yours is? I have all the... <laughs> <laughs> we have bits of all of them, yeah. I have all those styles in equal measure because everyone you went through, I was like, oh yeah, 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 so yeah. that fits. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, I think, you know, um, I'm guessing as one evolves and you know, heals and grows in maturity mm-hmm. that you eventually revert back to the more secure attachment style, mm-hmm. right? As Absolutely. you start to, yeah. you start to identify and ferret out in enmeshment uh, tendencies and codependency yes. and all of that. And neediness and, and, um, or like getting somebody gets close and then as soon as it gets too intimate, you're like, let me sabotage this or let me move away from this. That's more the avoidant. And so the, how we heal attachment styles, honestly, is in relationship. Most often intimate relationship, but even friendship, that, that's really how we heal them. And like, you're right, we move more and more towards secure. So mine is anxious. That was really... And we, we pretty much have one predominant one. And how I heal that is really not being codependent in my relationships, like learning how to fulfill my own needs and, and not be needy and also not worry so much. Like a a typical indicator of an anxious attachment style is you're dating someone and you don't know where you stand and the communication is like, "Mm," and you're anxious, anxious. And then you get a text from them and it's like, oh, I can relax now. Mm -hmm. So it's that that needing that connection Mm -hmm. and not really feeling safe without that person or without like connection or conversation with that person. And the avoidant, like I said, is, okay, I'll let you get this close, but any closer and I'm going to either sabotage this or I'm going to run or I'm really not going to let you in. And how you heal that is really working on relational intimacy in your in, in relationship. So being vulnerable, letting people see you. Just when I work with people that have that attachment style, it's like a little bit of time and a little more vulnerability and a little more and a little more until they start to be like, oh, all right, I don't have to run. I can trust this. So it's really about leaning into a relationship. And then with disorganized, so much of that comes from trauma. So that really is doing trauma work. You know, working with trauma-informed therapists, healing that trauma so that your nervous system can handle and process being in a relationship. Because with the disorganized attachment style, it's like you're always waiting for the shoe to drop. And it's really hard to be present and grounded in a relationship. Wow, that's such powerful information. Mm. I was tracing back to um, my first style would have definitely been avoidant, just never, you know, allowing for the potential of being hurt or abandoned or mm-hmm. anything. So just keep everyone at arm's length. Mm-hmm. But then as I started to evolve more spiritually and grow and, and heal some of those things, then um, I, I would say I became much more the, um, the anxious type, Mm -hmm. you know, because I was just learning how to be vulnerable and open hearted in that way. And it was terrifying, (laughs) you know, (laughs) and as I was, as I alluded to earlier, not having the skills of discernment around like being able to, um, well, not, not that it was even like their fault per se, but just trying to build healthy Mm -hmm. attachment style in relationships Mm -hmm. without having evolved and grown to the point where I could even handle that or attract someone who was also able to hold that. Right. Right. So right. it's like two people with absolutely different we attract 
our issues. Yeah, <laughs> different levels of, uh, you know, attachment style or availability or unavailability, kind of like, you know, cobbling that together. But um, it's funny now though, you know, kind of on the other side of a long, long time of being very avoidant. Now I would say there's still like a little bit of insecurity sometimes. Mm-hmm. And like, are we are we cool? Like mm-hmm. you mentioned that text thing. Oh my God, I remember that mm-hmm. when I first started to open my heart in relationships mm-hmm. and, you know, I'd be with someone who was on the kind of polarized, more avoidant mm-hmm. spectrum and just like waiting for that text and like, oh my God, so much anxiety. And then it comes in and it's like, oh God, oh, everything's really? fine. I was tripping. The world's okay now. They weren't mad or whatever. You know what I mean? No, yeah. they're, they're not dating someone else now. It's okay. You know, <laughs> yeah. I'll just be so paranoid. And I, I see that pop up. I mean, thankfully not much because I'm with someone who's so solid and just there, but they're still like every once in a while, you know, I'll yeah, human. send a text or mm-hmm. something and, or I think I've done something wrong and I'm like in trouble and there's that, you know, like bad mm-hmm. boy of mm-hmm. mommy's mad kind of energy. And I'm just like, oh God, yeah. I just can't stand. It's such a gross <laughs> dynamic, you know? Um, but it's good to see it and it's to, amazing. to know yeah. and, and yeah. anxious and attachment people are like flies to honey. They just attract each other because the soul's always seeking to grow, you know? And I always yeah. tell people, if you're attracted to someone like that drug, like if it's like yeah. a 10 plus attraction, you just can't get enough, run the other direction unless <laughs> you want to be in an issue-based relationship and really work on your triggers <laughs> because that's what it's going right. to be. And the oh, and I'm like, this is such a setup because it's set up so that we're so sexually attracted to someone because if if our, our we had our wits about us, we'd be like, no way. Like so many issues, so many red flags, but because we have this like, like chemical attraction, it's like, oh, this person's totally my person. And then all the issues pop up. I call them issue-based relationships and they're great because they serve a purpose. They serve the purpose to show us what we need to work on. They're usually not the relationships that like go the distance, but they're super important in our journey. Yeah, that's a great distinction. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I really, um, I'm grateful that I'm done with those type of relationships. Oh my gosh, <laughs> me too, me too. I had such a thing for avoidant guys. And I was like, I will be the one that yeah. changes them. My love will make them open their heart. No, Yeah. no. Yeah. Only he can do that. Um, in terms of something you mentioned earlier about being self-critical, mm. I think those of us that are really on the path of commitment to our evolution and growth, and this I think comes from you know all of my years in recovery, in order to become the person you want to be, it's really important to see those things about yourself that you don't want to be. So there's always this kind of uncovering of character defects or flaws or things that are wrong with your personality, the way that you think, the way you feel, the way you act. And so there's this excavation always going on of like looking for the next thing Mm. that is screwed up about me. Mm. And um, it's been a lot of work for me to actually build a practice into stopping and saying, let's look at all that's been accomplished yes. every once in a while. You yes. know, there's the risk of patting yourself on the back too much and think, well, I'm done, you know, <laughs> just carving the turkey, and, uh, you know. But, you know, I think for myself, I'm still quite critical and demanding and perfectionist because I'm just conditioned by my own methods of personal development and growth to be looking at the next thing that I need to fix or yeah. overcome. So yeah. how does one find um, balance in giving themselves some credit for what they've yeah. accomplished and, and gratitude for the grace that God has mm-hmm. shown them to help them along, mm-hmm. but still not blinding themselves to the things that are lurking in the shadow a bit that still could use addressing? Yeah. Well, it's interesting. As you were talking about that, a deer walked by and deer medicine is so much about gentleness. Oh, nice. And it's about like just being gentle with ourselves. And I think when we first... In those early years of diving deep, like there's always seems to be a point in someone's life where they're like, I'm going all in on therapy, on personal development. Like I'm going in. And it's like, once you're in, you can't turn back. It's like you dip your toe in the water for a while, but I'm sure people listening can relate to that moment when you're like, okay, I'm all in. And like, there's no turning back. Cause I'm not going, I'm not falling back asleep. I'm just not doing it. And so we go through this period where we need to dig and we need to look for kind of every little thing because we need to excavate a lot. Like we need to move a lot out. But then we sort of reach a point where it can become an addiction. 
It's like everything in our life, how did I create this? What is this reminding me of? Like, what issues is this from my childhood? And we need to sometimes go, you know what? I'm human and I'm going to mess up and I'm going to get triggered. And I have found a sense of humor is so important in evolution and personal development. You just look like sometimes I do shit and I'm just like, oh my God, I did that again? Like, that's hilarious that I'm still doing that. I know better. And I have a really good laugh about it or I laugh with my husband or good friends about it. So that gentleness and that sense of humor, I think is so important in the balance. And yeah, the credit, the acknowledgement. You know, we often look at how far we have to go versus how far we've came. And I think it's important to look back and not and give ourselves a pat on the back, but also go, whoa, I've come this far. I can keep going. Like if I've come this far, there's really nothing I can't handle. You know, when I've had things come up in my life lately, I look behind me and go, oh, I got this. Like I've I've come through so much. So I think looking at how far we've come, acknowledging ourselves because there's a lot of people out there still snoozing. There's a lot of people still asleep. I'm sure a lot of people listening can think of their own family and go, wow, I'm the one person in my family who's the black sheep who's waking up to you know, consciousness. And being proud of ourselves is important because that's another childhood need that many of us didn't get is mom and dad really being proud of you, not just of your accomplishments, but just of who you are. So that sense of pride and like, yeah, proud of myself. I've gone to some dark places. I've handled some pretty tough shit. I'm going to acknowledge that. And when things come up or I repeat a pattern, I'm going to you know, look at what I need to look at, but I'm also going to have a sense of humor about it. That's one thing I've discovered with my own journey. You know, When I was really first in it, and especially when I was getting off antidepressants, I was like hitting pillows and doing my anger work and doing my release writing and digging and going to my trauma therapist and somatic <laughs> therapy and just like, I was just going for it. And I needed to. Because it was such, I needed that kind of like dramatic shift and there's a lot to deal with. But now it's like, I can have a lightness about it and I can have a gentleness about it and I can shift things quicker and I don't have to beat myself up as much. So I think that balance, you know, when we begin, and it is a little off balance because we've got a lot of stuff to do, but eventually we reach a point where it's like, wow, I've done a lot and I, I have far to go in terms of my vision and values because that's really the switch. It's like we reach a point where we stop reacting from our past and creating from our past and healing and dealing our past. And we're like, whoa, what's my vision? And what are my values? And now I've kind of got this blank slate. I'm not reacting and creating from my past anymore. Whoa, like what do I want to create? And that's the exciting part. And I'm not saying when we get there, we don't still have triggers, But because we've got this vision and values pulling us forward, it's easier to manage those triggers because we've got that groundwork done. That's so awesome. So it's like the shift of focusing on what we do want rather than what we don't want. Exactly. Exactly. But in the beginning, there's a period of like, well, you really got to look at what you don't want because what you don't want is what keeps showing up, right? Exactly. Because you're stuck in those, you know, those patterns, those neural pathways that just keep yep. firing you in the same wrong direction. And this is where a lot of people get stuck and they think they're personal development failures because they read all the manifestation books and they do the dispensa meditations. And they do all the things except go back and deal with their past hurts and trauma. And they're like, why is my life not changing? Why am I not moving forward? I read all the books. I do all the things to create a different future. It's like, well, you got to clean up the past. And I see this over and over and over again. People that do the work to actually heal and clean up the past have a much easier time creating the future that they want. But people that try to create the future and do all this manifesting and visioning without cleaning up the past just end up repeating the past. Because remember, the nature of the soul is to grow. The soul isn't going to be like, oh, you can skip that lesson. Oh, sure. Skip that one too. Oh, skip that one too. Just have everything you want. It's going to be like, no, you got to learn these things. Right. When it comes to that point in the journey where one has done a lot of the deep work and now is sort of just spot check, Mm -hmm. you know, dealing with things as they come up and you're starting to develop that vision for what you want in your life, whether that be the person that you want to blossom into in a more internal sense or things that you want to achieve or accomplish, the home, relationship, career, et cetera. Um, how can one work on their vision while not getting in the trap of 
I'll be complete when, I'll be whole when, I'll be worthy when, I'll be happy when. You know, yeah. there's there's a balance there of being in content with you, your life, your relationship with God, your relationship with mm-hmm. your friends, mates, etc. Mm-hmm. in the now, but also exercising mm-hmm. that that desire that you have inside to to achieve, to be, to do more. Yeah. From my perspective, it's focusing on how you want to feel rather than the thing. So let's say the thing that you want is like a brand new house and you think that's going to make you happy. That, the or, thing I want is this house <laughs> no, that we're in right now. I want now. this house too. This is pretty awesome. But yeah. um, I think that's a legitimate desire and you should go for it. But when we, we tend to that when then, like when I have the house or when I have the relationship, and again, we're focused on the thing. So how we get there faster and healthier is how do I think that thing is going to make me feel? So if you know that having this house really isn't going to make you feel any better or different about yourself, you're just going to really freaking love having this house, but it's not filling any void inside of you. You're really coming from a place of, yeah, this just sounds like an awesome expression and something I want to experience in my life. Not when I have this house, then I'll feel successful. Or when I have this house, then I'll feel happy. Then we know it's actually just a healthy desire because it's it's more about how we feel about something than wanting it to fill a void. So for people that are in that stage where they're still working out a lot of the past and they have that tendency to go to the when then, stop focusing on the thing or the person. Focus on the feeling. So think, all right, when I have this relationship, then I'll feel confident. Or when I have this great job, then I'll feel enough. Okay, I want to feel confident and I want to feel enough. How can I start feeling those things and generating those feelings right now versus making them dependent on things? So that's really how we know the distinction. If we're wanting something to fill a void, then we got to just let go of that thing and generate the feeling we think it's going to give us. But if we're just like feeling drawn to something or called to something, not because it's going to fill a void, but just because it's just cool. It's just awesome. It's an experience that would be cool to have. And it's not coming from scarcity, not coming from lack. And we don't have devastation if we don't get it. Then it's like, wow, that's just a healthy way to have desires because it's normal for humans to vision and have desires. And, you know, I was talking to some people the other night and I was like, you know, I realized a couple of years ago, the feeling I was chasing for so many years was just being content. And content is not something that people have tattooed on their arms or have gold necklaces saying content, you know, it's not one of those words that's like really hot for your word of the year. (laughs) But I was like, that's just what I'm wanting. I, all those years, I just wanted to feel content. I wanted to feel like I was enough. I had enough. I'd done enough contentment. And when I reached that point in my life, it wasn't because I checked any boxes. It was because I got to a place inside myself where I wasn't searching for anything anymore to make me feel a certain way. And so now anything I desire, it's just like, oh, that would be cool. And I'm content if it never happens. We want to have the high intention and low attachment. So be intentional about things, have visions, but low attachment so that if it doesn't happen, totally fine. Beautiful. You have such great answers to all my questions. (laughs) Well, you ask great questions. (laughs) Thank you. It's just, it's really, it's really, really good stuff. Um, Let me see. Okay. So I'm observing you in your public figure dome. Mm. You know, of course, when I interview someone, I look at every page on their website and really get a sense of what they're doing in the world and what their message is. And I've got a sense of your message but what you're doing um, seems to be a lot. You know, you're, you as a personal brand, I mean, I'm like, Jesus, how many courses does she have? You know, and I guess now you're not doing in-person events, or right. I'm assuming, because um, of the thing, the thingy. Um, but I'm like, damn, homegirl is busy. Mm. Like, I guess the question is, what are your thoughts or practices on work-life balance? Because yeah. you seem to be someone who's very prolific, successful, doing things, helping tons of people, tons of offerings. Mm. Yet I'm assuming, you know, you're in a healthy, happy relationship. You're living your best life. How do you succeed, achieve, drive, push, allow, and yet also still just have time to do you and do your life and family and friends and all of that? Well, I learned this one the hard way. (laughs) I was, um, I I do, I, I write, I do a lot of keynote speaking courses, podcasts, and have a coaching practice and train coaches. 
So it's it a lot. And luckily I have a woman named Jill who's worked with me for over a decade now. And she's like, uh, without her, I, I don't know if I, <laughs> I'd have a nervous breakdown by now. So she's amazing. I have that incredible partner and support. But I am someone that can push pretty hard. And again, that comes from some of my wounding. And I would just go and go and go and go and go. And then after mm, 12 years of doing that, my health started to go. Adrenal fatigue, weird viruses, heart palpitations, panic attacks out of nowhere. Just It was like... And that's that was the wake-up call for me of I'm doing too much. Like I'm doing too much. And I also wanted to bring a relationship into my life. And I, I really didn't have the space for it. I... I said I did, but I really, really didn't. And so it was that health crisis that made me go, Ooh, okay, some things need to change. And what I was able to realize and the fear I tapped into is if I let go of any, it felt like I was juggling. And I felt like if I dropped any one of those balls, the whole thing would just come crashing down. And the lesson for me in that is actually doing less can create more. And another lesson was really tapping into my feminine energy because my core essence is feminine. That's just who I am. But I had so many masculine masks and adaptive strategies on top of that, that that just kind of became my go-to. And it was that physical breakdown that made me go, whoa, maybe I can't do all this. Maybe my mind can, but my body and my nervous system and my soul is tired, just needs to stop. And so I was able to really go, okay, what do I really love doing? Do I love getting on planes like a lot? I mean, after when quarantine hit, that was the longest. We didn't get on a plane from March till July. And that was the longest I hadn't been on a plane in about 12 years. So I was just like going, going, going. And I really started a question like what, what feels aligned versus... Because I used to ask the question before of, well, if I stop doing this, what will happen? Like what will break down? And I was able to put that question aside and just go, what feels most aligned? And it was really like a, a trust experiment of if like, is it really okay just to do what I want to do? Like, do I have to do all these other things? Can I just focus on what I want? And the only way to know, this is uncertainty, right? The only way to know is to do it. There's no crystal ball with these things. And so it was really surrendering and going, all right, I'm going to keep working on myself. I'm going to rest. I'm going to rejuvenate. I'm going to start saying no to things I don't want to do. I'm going to clear a lot off my plate, a lot off my schedule, let myself heal. And the interesting thing that happened is as my body healed and I got married, I started realizing, wow, like things are still coming in. Like I don't have to push and force so much. In fact, without having such a full play, things that I didn't even think of are starting to come in that are more aligned. And that's the thing about tunnel vision and being just in that masculine energy is when we're so busy and so focused, it's like the universe is going, hey, over here, like I'm trying to get your attention. But so because we're so much looking over here, it's like we miss it. And so it's been a beautiful experience for me to really drop into that feminine superpower of receptivity. Because that is, I mean, feminine superpower, basic anatomy, we're the receivers. And to trust it and to trust that I don't have to do, 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 do in order to really have the, the life that is fulfilling to me. And then I also had to look at over-responsibility. I have a little bit of that caretaker I need to help as many people as I can thing. And so I really had to look at that and go, you know what? Everyone's a sovereign being. Everyone can find their own way. I'm not the savior. It's not my responsibility. And and like the person I need to take care of most is me because I don't I don't take care of me. I I'm worthless to anybody else. So it was it was a journey. That's really great though. Mm. That's really great. Yeah. Hearing that, I'm going, I think I need more feminine energy. <laughs> I've just been grinding, you know. Yeah, I can relate. But also yeah. like what you were talking about about um, you know, the feeling. It's the 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 end result of those things that we're working toward, right? Yeah. It's not it's not the thing. So it's never the thing. It's I, I was reflecting as you were speaking on um, you know, just being in this really lovely house out mm-hmm. in the in the country um here in Texas and I just feel so good here. So my thought is, well, if I want to feel like this, then I need to get one of these. Yeah. <laughs> and that's the feeling. But that feeling could be with me anywhere if it I could. were to, if I were to cultivate that feeling. And and the 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 kind of human need that I identified in there is a feeling of security. Yeah. I think so much because of the way things are in the world right now, and not yep. feeling 
safe and comfortable in my former, soon to be former home of Los Angeles. You know, I'm there for 32 years and just I'm there. I do not feel safe. I don't feel secure for a number of different reasons, which I'll probably illuminate in a solo cast Mm -hmm. one of these days once I get out of there. Um, But it's like that feeling of security can be had anywhere if one really goes about cultivating that yeah. and 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 celebrating that, yeah. you know, because when I look at the world around me, and especially when I'm in a place where it feels very volatile mm-hmm. and temporary, um, it's difficult to find that, you yeah. know. It, but I think that's that's really what I'm what I'm looking for. So there's this sense of urgency with career and money and finding a place to live. Mm-hmm. It's like that sense of urgency and mm-hmm. pushing comes out of a fear of not having security and safety yeah. for myself and my my small little family of two pets yeah. and one one lady. Yeah. You know, so it's like, hmm, that's interesting. So perhaps one can just fast forward to the feeling of security. And then you're more likely to draw <laughs> right. in right. what you like because our environment does play a role. Like it yeah. absolutely does. We 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 cultivate the feelings and we want to not be attached to things and the relationships where we live, our job impact us. But it's always, we want to do the inside out approach, not the outside in. We don't want this house to give me this. We want to feel this and then gener- you know, draw in this house so that when you, know, you, you get to a house, you're like, oh, this is it. I can relax. Not this house is going to make me relax. It's like you walk in and it's like it happens immediately. And that's really the, the dance of being human because we're living in this you know, 3D, 5D, however you want to say it, world where physical things and where we live and who we're with and how we work and we're in this game where all that matters. And so we want to make it as aligned as possible. And how we do that, bottom line, clear out our past and focus on generating the feelings we want to feel so that we're, we're attracting and creating things from the inside out. How do you feel being back here in your home state mm. of Texas? You, Great. You like like so many of us in California have done the uh I think there's a word for it like blexit. It's like cagsit or something. <laughs> you know <what> I mean? <laughs> That's good. Um yeah, it's something Cal-zit like Calzit or Cali Exit so, or something. Yeah, something, yeah. something like that. How are you uh how are you settling mm. back into uh the the Lone Star state here? I love it. You know, I had a feeling California. I kept having dreams about California burning and all kinds of things when I was still living in LA. And I moved to San Diego and got kicked out of two places there because the landlord just wanted to move in. And California kept pushing me out. And, um, you know, I married somebody from Australia who grew up on the beach. So I never thought I'd get him to move to Texas. Like I, I thought we'd have to be by the ocean. And he came here to visit my parents um, a couple years ago. And he's walking down the street. He's like, damn it. I go, what? Did you forget something? He goes, no, damn it. I said, what? He goes, my body really likes it here. I was like, hmm, that's interesting. <laughs> and then a year later, um, right before we got married, we made decided to make the move. And it's been, you know, someone, we were playing a game the other night, a bunch of my girlfriends and I. Um, and one of the questions was, if you could name this chapter of your life, what would you name it? And my name for this chapter would be Grounding. I feel like I'm grounding and rooting and I'm not so like all over the place and I'm creating my family with my husband and possibly children and and the community and just like really grounding. And that's really what Texas feels like. It feels like this incredible grounding energy with also this expansiveness of consciousness. It just feels like a really special place to be. You know, I have to say that's been my experience here as well. Yeah. Yeah, I feel very calm and still here. Yes. It's really interesting. Yes. It's palpable, especially after just having spent a month and a half in Sedona, <laughs> as we were talking about earlier. Yeah, kind of, uh, yeah. yeah, I was, I don't know. I like to think I'm pretty chill. I was psycho in Sedona. Like I was very edgy. Yeah. It doesn't yeah. work for everybody. Some people are like, I, it's a vortex and it's amazing. For me, I'm like... Get me out of this vortex. I'm ready to go. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, and it's beautiful and there's so many redeeming qualities. So great. In terms of feeling grounded in in a home kind of way. uh, Yeah. yeah, It wasn't that, but it's it's been incredible to be out here. And I love the idea you've you floated. Um, and Kyle uh, mentioned to me too about, you know, all of us getting a big ass property out here, just making our own community. Yeah. So I noticed that 
everyone here is between 30 and 45 minutes apart. Kind of mm-hmm. everyone that, mm-hmm. you know, we all know very similar people and run in, in the same circles of like-minded people. And that's beautiful. Um, but it, you know, everyone is kind of spread out. Yeah. Because it's so huge here. Yeah. That's the other weird thing is, is like getting a sense of this place on a map is impossible. It, it, it doesn't because, make sense. Yeah. yeah, because it's like, you're like, that thing's just right there. It's just right down the street from the thing. And then you get in your car and you're like, oh no, that's 45 minutes. That's like, <laughs> that's like 60 miles, you know, but on the map, it's like, no, it's right there. It's really... It's, I know, because there's water we have to get around here. Yeah. So it makes things longer. But here's yeah. what's so cool about Austin. So you lived in LA, so you know this. People are flaky. It's like, you never know if someone was going to show up at a plan because something better could come along. Like yeah. flaky, flaky. People here, they say they're going to do something, they do it. Like I, I hosted a little thing at my house Saturday night and not one person flaked. And I was like, whoa, I expected at least three. You know, that's yeah, the yeah. average, you know, given there are sure. about 11 people, okay, three will flake. That's the average California flakiness percentage. Everybody showed up. And, and I love that. There's like this, um, you're not, not yearning, but commitment to community, which is really, really cool. And there's not this like do you belong or do you belong? And, you know, it's a very welcoming. Texas is just welcoming anyway. Um, and so I hope everyone moving here from all those other states, like bring your bring your friendliness here. <laughs> yeah, and don't vote for the same kind of people oh, that, gosh, please that no. ruined the state please that no. you're in. Remember why you moved here, please. <laughs> when I'm in downtown Austin, sometimes I see things on the street that remind me very much of downtown Los Angeles. Yeah. And I'm like, mm, too many people from LA are voting <laughs> poorly. <laughs> or like, why is this happening? Uh, yeah. But anyway, I, yeah. we'll, we will talk about that on another podcast. Mm. But I swear, if, if we do end up here, I am not going to bring bad policies from California to yeah, Texas. Yeah, just change your plates ASAP. <laughs> no, oh my God. You know what's so funny? I, ha- I rented that SUV out there yeah. and I didn't know it had California plates. Oh no. Yeah, I had no idea. I was like, I rented it at the Austin airport. Yeah. And I'm driving around and man, all these big Trump trucks are like on my ass. Like, I'm like, dude, I'm going 60, you know? And they're like <laughs> pushing, you know? And I'm like, and then Alice is like, oh, that's funny. We have California plates. I was like, oh, oh. no wonder. Mm-hmm. I'm moseying along, mm-hmm. you know, trying to get the lay of the land, observing everything and probably driving slower than someone who knows these yeah. roads yeah, like yeah, the yeah. back of their hand and yeah. has a big diesel dually truck or whatever. A lot of those. A lot of yeah, those. And I'm like, definitely got to change the plates immediately if you move here so that yeah. you don't get run off the road by a good old boy who's in a real hurry. <laughs> Funny stuff. Uh, well, I think we've covered it. I feel complete. Mm. I feel blessed mm, uh, by your presence you. and wisdom. And I'm going to ask you my last question now, Christine, which mm-hmm. is, <laughs> you may have heard it before mm-hmm. if you're listening to the podcast. I do listen to your podcast. Uh, who are three teachers or teachings that have influenced your work, your mm-hmm. life, who you mm-hmm. are, who you've become that uh, you might recommend to our listeners? So um, the person that really influenced my life probably more than anyone else, because she got me at such an early age. I started seeing her when I was 22, is a woman. She's no longer living, unfortunately. Her name is Mona Miller. She wrote a book called Invisible Warfare, uh, but it wasn't her book that changed my life. I, I saw her once a week for about 14 years and she helped me become a coach. And she was the one that held my hand when I was, held my hand metaphorically and sometimes physically when I was moving through my journey of getting off antidepressants and just was unconditional love and wisdom. I felt so blessed to be able to know her and study with her for so many years. Um, my master's degree in spiritual psychology is from a place called the University of Santa Monica. And the teachers there, Mary Mary and Ron Holnick, the things that I learned there were an extension of everything that Mona taught me, but it was just this beautiful two-year program where I I got to really connect with people and bond with people. And I learned so much about myself and really brought the spirituality back into my life. And then another, I mean, there's so many I could list, but to kind of cover some of the stuff we talked about, my, my... Favorite teachers in masculine feminine dynamics are David Data and Alison Armstrong. Um, Intimate Communion, I think, is an incredible book to really... Oh, Thank yeah. you for reminding me of yeah. Alison Armstrong. I used to listen to her tapes years ago yeah. and then I was like, oh, I got to interview her and I kind of forgot. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, after my divorce, I really devoured that work because I realized how much in my first marriage, I really just didn't understand polarity and was way more of my masculine energy and really didn't know how to bring the best out in my husband. And I really wanted to to learn how to have that healthy dynamic. So Intimate Communion is a great book. Um, Alison Armstrong's stuff is really great too. Did a lot of her courses and really helped me. I, I love her because she teaches in such a real, no frills, 
way. And you kind of have to get beyond like when I first started listening to her, I'm like, oh, she wants me to be like a 1950s housewife. Like this sounds awful. But when you dig deeper and you actually get what she's saying, it's so much about empowerment for both men and women. And that really having that healthy balance of masculine feminine energy. So so many good teachers, but those that's, are a few. That's great. Thank you for yeah. uh, the reminder. I'm going to see if I can track her down now. Yeah, she is on one of my original goals. You know, oh. yeah, I wrote a list of all the people I wanted to interview, and um, I've gotten to a few of them. You know, uh, but she's one that I have to get to. I'm David sure you will. Data doesn't do podcasts. You can't no, get him. You can't. So I got his his protege, John, John yeah. Wineland, You He's know, great. a few times on the show, but I I find that. Um, that framework of teaching to be so relevant uh, and useful also yes. to just kind of same with John Gray. I've interviewed John Gray three great. times and hung out and listened to his stuff over and over again. And it's just like, if you take out the political correctness, it's just sort of common sense and mm-hmm. biology, mm-hmm. you know? And when you're talking about energy, it goes beyond what genitals you have too. It does, it's like, yeah. where do you want to be energetically in a relationship? Yep. And how can each party find access to those energies within themselves mm-hmm. and have some awareness mm-hmm. of how they work and which one you want to be operating from at any given time? Yeah. You know, it's really, really important for people that want to relate. And I can't wait to, uh, on to what I think it's Saturday. Saturday. We get to have our foursome. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that'll be my first podcast with four people. Oh, cool. Because I could never figure out how to get my fourth mic to work. <laughs> I attempted it <laughs> once and I, I had to have one woman sit out the conversation. I'm like, I'm so sorry Aww. you came over, but you're going to have to observe. Uh, but now I've got it down. I've got awesome. four mics. So I'm, I'm looking forward to, uh, to talking to both of you and doing like a round table discussion on all things all relationships. Things. Yeah. yeah. Conflict, masculine and feminine stuff, sacred yeah. union, sacred sexuality, all the, all the things. Yeah. I'm mm. stoked because I, I think One of the reasons I've done so many relationship shows is that's been the final frontier for me to Mm. gain some success or maybe even mastery in some ways. I say that lightly, but (laughs) you'd have to ask Allison if that's true. But I've gotten pretty good at it, you know? I'm sure you have. Um, So, you know, you teach what you most need to learn and I've really focused on that. But aside from that, I just think, God, when we're talking about childhood trauma and looking back at the lineage of my family and all of the the survivors and warriors that I know that are on the path, mm-hmm. it's like so much of that comes from the dysfunctional relationship of their parents. So if we yes. can teach our generation and the generations to follow how to relate in a healthier way, different world. Like, oh my God, there's a you know the future generations will be so well served yep. by the work that we're doing. So yeah, yep. I'm excited to. Uh, to do more of that with me you. Too, me too. In closing, where can people find you? Website, social media, mm-hmm. et cetera. Uh, ChristineHasler.com. You can sign up for my free coaching assessment, take you through a little process. And then Instagram is my favorite social media platform. Great. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Thanks for joining me. Thanks so much for having me. Well, that my friends concludes episode 327 of the Lifestylist podcast. Thank you so much for joining me and Christine. In this conversation, as usual, it was incredibly inspiring for me. I learned a ton. I hope you did as well. I'd like to encourage you to follow Christine and her work as well as her podcast. Her podcast, as I indicated in this conversation with her, is really interesting. It's it's a bit unique. Kind of reminds me of an old school radio call-in show. And she really does some deep work with people on there. It's, it's fascinating. She's a true master at her craft. So I want to encourage you to uh, support her work. And also, I want to encourage you to learn how to limit, reduce, or completely eliminate the electromagnetic frequencies in your home and life. And you can do so with my EMF Home Safety Masterclass. You can find that at lukestory.com slash EMF Masterclass. This is over five and a half hours of video content for only, I feel like a real sales guy, the low, low price of $149, but it really is a low, low price. It's $149 bucks for hours and hours of content that's going to demystify and de scientify EMFs for you so you can find um, where they are perhaps interfering in your life and home and fix them in a non-paranoid, really practical way. I put everything I've got into this course because EMFs are kind of my sort of my niche. You know, a lot of people are into eating right and taking the herbs and doing all the biohacking. And I love all that stuff. But honestly, and I'm not trying to get your $149 here. This is just the truth in my own experience. 
uh, without really taking a look at the EMF issue in our modern world today, uh, I honestly believe it's impossible to really be truly healthy and vital uh, unless you live in the middle of freaking nowhere. And even then, you might have a smart meter on the side of your house that's blasting a receiver 30 miles away and you're unaware of it. So without being tinfoil hatty and paranoid, uh, I'm going to highly suggest that you check out lukestory.com slash EMF masterclass and at least get a fundamental and basic understanding of what EMFs are, the common sources of them, and of course, how to fix them. And with that, let's go ahead and thank our official sponsors, the first of which being kineuphorics.com slash Luke. These guys make, of course, the fantastic non-alcoholic elixir drinks. They really taste like tasty cocktails, but they don't have any of that pesky alcohol for those of you that are, you know, at various times in your life, perhaps avoiding alcohol. I've been avoiding it for just about, uh, let me see, 24 years now and plan to continue to avoid it for the rest of my days for reasons we don't have time to get into. But no, seriously, Ken Euphorics um, are really creating some great products there. So you can find it again at kineuphorics.com slash Luke. They've got some cocktails that help you uh, be at ease and socialize and, and sleep well and relax and also some that are going to perk you up. So uh, check it out at kineuphorics.com slash Luke and you're going to save 15% just by using that link. Next up, we want to keep your gut healthy and you can do so at justthrivehealth.com slash Luke. That's justthrivehealth.com slash Luke. They've got the Immuno product over there. They've got the K2. They've got the spore-based probiotics. These guys are uh, one of the top leaders in the field. JustThriveHealth.com slash Luke. The code there is Luke15, and that gives you 15% off. And then finally, our buddies over at Organifi. Man, these guys have been so good to me. You know, they were one of my first sponsors, and their products are just solid. I mean, that's it. You know, they've got the Organifi red juice, green juice, the gold all sorts of different things now. I mean, they've expanded uh, exponentially since I first started working with them a few years ago. Um, And they're still one of my favorites. They're just just a solid ass company that really care about their products and care about their customers. And it's been a real pleasure to grow with them. Um, It's been just amazing to see what they've been able to accomplish. It's quite impressive. If you want to check out your Organifi products, here's what you do. Go to Organifi.com slash Lifestylist. That's Organifi spelled with an I, by the way. Organifi.com slash Lifestylist. The code there is 20% off uh, and it is Lifestylist. Go figure. So those are our sponsors. That's my plug for my incredible EMF class. I, I kind of suck at promoting that class. I put a lot into it. Then I did a big launch and the launch was exhausting. So I thought, I don't know, I'm just going to leave it on the back burner. Um, yet it's still there and the people that are in the course love it and people have gotten so much out of it. So I thought I'd let you know about it as well. I think it's kind of top of mind now because I'm prepping uh, as I record this. I'm like three weeks from moving to Austin, Texas. I'm sure I'll be talking about that more on the show. I mean, honestly, who is not moving to Austin, Texas at this point? Sorry, Texans. I know it's, it's a bitch, but I swear I'll be, I'll be nice. I'll be a good Californian. But uh, seriously, I'm thinking a lot about the EMF because I just um, am in the process of buying a house there and I did not do any EMF readings. I did go on antennasearch.com and search for local antennae. Uh, there were a few, you know, a couple miles away, not not ideal, uh, but I am living kind of out in the burbs a bit outside of downtown Austin. So I'm out of 5G range, thankfully, but you bet your bottom dollar or bet your ass that when I get keys to this house, the very first thing I'm going to do is go in there and deal with the EMF. And finally, I'm going to be able to shield the house completely because I will be the owner. You know, in the place I'm recording from right now in lovely Laurel Canyon, Los Angeles, I've been leasing for two years. And so, you know, I've done a lot of EMF mitigation here with the Blue Shield products and Soma Vedic. My computer that I'm talking to you on right now is hardwired with ethernet and I've done, you know, I've got the uh, FLFE service turned on on this address. I did a show about that recently. Incredible service, by the way, flfe.net slash Luke gets you a 15 day trial of that. That's flfe.net slash Luke. Probably the most comprehensive EMF protection uh, that you can get. So I've done a lot of things here in the house, but I haven't gone full on like eliminating all Wi-Fi in the house, hardwiring everything, you know, shielding all the walls with shielding paint so that you're literally like your cell phone won't work inside the house, just living in a Faraday cage. That's been my dream. And that's what I'm going to do when I move to Texas. So um, 
It's a process, but you can learn all about that process in the EMF course. And I think that's why it's kind of coming back to mind now because I'm like, oh shit, I need to take my own course and do all the stuff it says in there uh, if I really want to have a clean home, energetically speaking, when I get there. So I think that's it, my friends. Uh, What's up next? Yeah, this week uh, we've got a Friday show. Sometimes I put out two shows a week, sometimes one. This week you're in for a real treat. The Joe Dispenza play-by-play field report I did with my lovely Allison. Uh, Each day we went back to our hotel room and recorded our experience of that week-long intensive retreat with Dr. Joe. And uh, a lot of people have been asking for that for a long time. And um, it, it was it was actually kind of difficult to do that. I'm not going to lie. I mean, there's worse jobs to have, but each day we're like, oh God, why did we commit to doing this? Because we were just so smoked from, you know, meditating for five and a half hours, right? Um, so anyway, that's this Friday. And then, uh, and then of course, you know, we've got Christine back on 332, where we do a relationship roundtable with her husband, Stefanos, and, uh, and my Allison. That's going to be a really good one, February 23rd. And then uh, next week, we're back with my friend Drew Canoli, who is actually, speaking of Organifi, he's the founder of Organifi. And we've become friends, and he's just an amazingly positive, inspiring guy. So I'm loving life, you guys. Man, you know, I know the world is seemingly uh, a shit show at the moment, and it's a wild ride, and some of us are really struggling. And if you're struggling emotionally, mentally, with all that's happened, In the past year or so, I just have so much love and empathy for you. It's not been easy for any of us, myself included, but I am more committed than ever to just staying on my course and really (laughs) having discernment about the things in the world that I can control and the things that I can't. And one thing I know for sure that I can't control is the pharmaceutical or military or technological industrial complex that seems to be (laughs) overtaking the humanity at the moment. And at a certain point, you just got to, I mean, you just got to laugh. You just got to go, wow, this is the duality. This is all God. God created all of this. The creator created all this, all the, the darkness, all the light, all of the love, all the hate. It's all one thing, folks. And so I'm really, really doing my best uh, to stay in that space. And so if you hear this show and I sound really happy and I seem to be ignoring world events that are completely catastrophic and out of control, uh, I'm doing that on purpose. I'm not um, unaware that uh, many people are struggling. But I also have refused um, this year as one of my New Year's resolutions to fall into like a survivor's guilt um, psychological phenomenon where I feel guilty about being happy when so many people are having a hard time. Um, And it's not that I don't have compassion for people that are struggling because God knows I've uh, I've served my time in the trenches of pain in this lifetime uh, with all of the addiction and abuse and childhood shit and everything I've been through. But, you know, I have also worked my ass off uh, metaphysically for the past 24 years to learn little by little by little. And I mean, so slowly how to keep my balance and stay in a spiritual homeostasis even when the world around me seems to be crumbling. And so my spiritual practices have really been put to the test this year like all of ours and I'm just committed to staying on purpose and I'm committed to facing anything and everything that comes up in my experience, whether it be complete bliss or abject despair. Um, I refuse to bypass and I'm all about just lasering through whatever I might come up against with absolute unconditional love for everything that is, because ultimately everything that is, is exactly how it's supposed to be, as crazy as that might sound. So that's my sermon in a totally unexpected way at the end of this show. But I think as we enter into 2021, it's just like, I can't not mention, you know, what's happening, right? Things are very strange, but at the same time, I'm probably happier, not probably, I'm actually... 100% happier in my life right now than I ever have been. Finding more peace than ever before. Because I've had to. I've had to. I just have no choice. This is, well, I guess you always have a choice, but uh, there's something within my spiritual will that just keeps me driving toward the goal of self realization and enlightenment and um, being. You know, vexed about the problems of the world at large is not the way out for me. So it's just nose to the grindstone, deeper meditation, deeper prayer, deeper surrender, deeper trust in spirit, and continuing to do everything I can to be of service to my fellow 
humans. And you, my friend, are one of them. God bless you. I love you. And thank you so much for listening to this show. Be back soon.